Uh, we'll begin our city council meeting for Tuesday, March 12th. Welcome everyone. Uh, Tony, could I ask for you to call the roll, please? Menez? Perales? Here. Diep? Present. Carrasco? Davis? Esparza? Arenas? Here. Foley? Here. Camus? Jones? Here. Licardo? Here. We have a quorum. All right, thank you. Um, wherever you might be, if you might uh, please stand, if you're able, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States, United of, States of America and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, one nation, one nation under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, and justice for, all. for all. Thank you. Councilman Member just confirming there'll be no invocation at this time. Is that right? Okay, if I see her jump on, then I'll, we'll back up. Um, on to uh, orders of the day. Does anyone have any changes to the printed agenda? Okay, I'm going to suggest, uh, I guess this really wouldn't be for orders of the day. I'll, I'll raise it in item 3.1, uh, bit of a different approach for proceeding. So uh, is there a motion on orders of the day? So moved. Second. All right. Uh, motion from the vice mayor, second from Councilmember Davis. Uh, we have or no. Foley. Okay, or Foley, sure. Thank you. <laughs> My screen is merging together. Uh, all right. Uh, is there any objection to the motion on orders of the day? All right, I'm hearing none. So we're going to move on to the closed session report, Rick. I'm actually not seeing if Rick is on at this time. So we'll come back to Rick on the closed session report uh, so he can join us. Um, I do see Ed on, I think. Yes. Uh, oh, Ed. I, unfortunately, it was not a closed session, so I cannot give the report. Okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> well, I guess I could, but I don't know if there's anything to report. So we'll, <laughs> we'll move on then uh, to the report of the city manager. And I'd like to, after talking to a couple of colleagues who were observing that, <laughs> that the 3.1 obviously is a very important item uh, during this pandemic as we're all trying to gather more information and understand. And we want also the city manager's office to present information to the public at this time. And we, we appreciate that's all very, very critically important. Uh, this has gone on quite long <laughs> and at times as many as four or five hours. And so um, the thought was, uh, that after the presentation, obviously all council members have many questions to ask, uh, was to limit the, the question and the answer of each individual council member to 10 minutes. But know that Kim Wallish and Chris Burton will continue to be available for as council liaisons to the EOC. And of course, Dave will also be available for additional questions throughout the week. But we really want to try to focus as much of this uh, time toward uh, questions that are important for you or for the public to hear the answers to. Uh, and, and that way then we can manage the rest of the calendar, uh, particularly given the fact that so many folks who are here for 3.1 are the same people who are responsible for running the Emergency Operations Center. And we want them to get back to work as quickly as possible. So that's what I wanted to propose for today. Uh, we'll see how it works. And uh, if uh, it doesn't work well, we'll, we'll, we'll adjust. Uh, Dave, uh, we're on to the report of the city manager. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, appreciate the opportunity. Uh, we, we continue to work with a great sense of urgency, of course. Um, but as I mentioned last week, you know, treating this as a marathon now um, and really wanting to, to continue that sense of urgency, but, but also pace ourselves um, to ensure that we can continue to, to serve the community in, in a in a meaningful way. Um, 
certainly we're uh, working on uh, the COVID front. Uh, as you all know, we're working on the budget front and just a, a brief update. Uh, we still have not published the, the proposed budget yet. Um, uh, the team is continuing to work extremely hard. We do anticipate being able to do that this afternoon and, and then preserve the remainder of the budget schedule. Um, and then also, I think you're seeing the fact that, uh, you know, our other essential services are, uh, there's a somewhat of a pent up uh, demand to move certain things forward. And we're needing to do that to keep our other, other lines of business uh, moving and operating. And so um, just a lot going on. Um, so I wanna start off our unsung heroes with, um, with one of those items, the, the Community Energy Department heroes. And certainly while the, the public's focus um, has been mostly on our, our COVID response, um, as I said, there's, there's many other essential city operations that are going on um, every day. And the Community Energy Department has worked really hard to ensure seamless um, electricity generation during uh, all the stay at home orders, all the staff are at home working from home. Um, you know, to that end, the, the department recently signed two new power purchase agreements that will bring uh, enough solar energy to power nearly 79,000 homes. Um, and I want to thank the community energy department for all their hard work and leadership and, and just keeping uh, the lights on, if you will, um, as, we, as we go through this, this uh, unusual time frame. Um, and then there's actually three employees I wanna recognize from different places in the organization um, and representing different work that's going on. Um, the first is Nancy Macias from the library department. She's a public information representative with, with the library. Uh, Nancy and others have worked tirelessly to communicate library resources to the public during, uh, during the closure uh, because there are many of those uh, library services can be accessed. And she, Nancy oversees newsletters, social media, and creates content for weekly updates in, in English and Spanish. Um, Nancy is also uh, lending her media relations talents to the, uh, the emergency PIO, PIO functions in the EOC. So thank you, Nancy. Um, the second employee is Greg Twilliger from Public Works. Greg is a senior electrician in, in that department um, and certainly his prior experience working in emergencies has been a tremendous uh, resource for the department and he has helped develop safety procedures and work plans to keep critical infrastructure going at a time where we can't operate in a normal function and, and we're having to make all these adjustments so just want to thank Greg for his creativity and and, and designing uh, procedures that will keep our employees safe. And then finally, um, I would like to recognize uh, Felicita Nichols in PRNS. Uh, Felicita is a youth in intervention worker uh, working with uh, Youth Interventions female intervention team. Uh, due to COVID-19, she can't spend time working with young women uh, that she's responsible for working with. Um, however, she has taken an outside the box approach to her work by incorporating Zoom uh, for our curriculum and DJ sets and writing prompts and other means of connecting virtually with participants. So just fantastic work. And so just want to thank all of all of our employees for continuing their dedication and creativity during these times. Um, want to just highlight that uh, we notified you all yesterday, uh, the Silicon Valley Strong Grant Program for San Jose Small Businesses launched um, yesterday. Uh, the program is being administered by our partner, uh, Opportunity Fund and is funded by generous donors. Uh, it will provide working capital grants of 10,000 to eligible small businesses in San Jose uh, that have suffered financial losses due to COVID. Uh, grants can be used to cover costs such as employee payroll uh, and two week sick leave, um, paid sick leave, rent and utilities, outstanding debts to vendors and other operating costs. I uh, anticipate 142 grants will be awarded and applications close this Sunday, uh, March 17th at 11.59. Uh, the administration is working with the Opportunity Fund on an additional small business loan program, which is funded with $2.5 million in CDBT grants. Um, next, I wanna just notify the council. Um, last week we received a, a letter from the county, um, a call for con tact tracing staff and so the county is 
expanding its infrastructure uh, for case investigation and, and contact tracing. And they're looking for uh, 700 uh, contact tracers. This same letter went to, I think, every jurisdiction in the county. Um, I just want to link this to item number two in the, in the mayor's back to work memo. And so we are, we are evaluating our own capacity. There's some criteria uh, for the tracers and there's some time frame commitments um, for the tracers that we're looking at. Um, but certainly I think it's in all of our best interest to be able to support the county in this effort uh, as we try to get everyone back to work and, and back to their lives. Um, so that, uh, that does it for my piece of this. I'm gonna hand it over to the team um, where um, you're gonna hear from Kip uh, providing uh, some information. And I think some of this came out of some of the questions from last week around date, data and patterns and insight and kind of where we're going. And then uh, Lee is gonna head up a discussion on recovery um, where you'll hear from uh, Ray and Lee and Luce and Benna and, and Jim Shannon. Uh, talking about certainly uh, the waterfall when it comes to some of the recovery dollars and how we're going to propose to use them uh, and what that means for us as a city. So I'm going to ask uh, Lee to start us off. Thank you, Dave. And on uh, behalf of Kip Harkness and I, I've, I've been our Emergency Operations uh, Center Director for the last week, and I will be kicking us off. Next slide. Um, while most of our presentations um, have focused on our outputs for the city roadmap um, for the COVID-19 crisis, today we'll be presenting on two different topics, as, as Dave mentioned, uh, a little bit more of a narrower focus, um, really an update on the data and insights for the crisis and the importance of compliance with the public health order and where we are today with that, which Kip will be walking through. And then as Dave mentioned, we're gonna focus on roadmap um, uh, item number seven, which is really our initial funding, um, our initial funding strategy, our cost recovery strategies, as well as um, the work that we're putting in and where we are at with an official source and use statement for our overall response and recovery process related to COVID-19. Um, so that is the agenda, and I'm going to hand it over to Kit to walk through our first section of the presentation. Thank you, Lee. Kip Harkness, Deputy City Manager and Incoming Director of the Emergency Operations Center. I did want to take a moment to, to walk us through some of what we know now about COVID-19, the trajectory and the arc of this disease. And I use as our starting point this notion that, that Sri Shivananda taught me when he was CTO at PayPal. Data by itself is meaningless, but from data we can begin to see patterns, from patterns we can derive insights, and from insights we can drive action. And that's how we've been working throughout this crisis is to, to seek to use data, to see those patterns, to derive insights, and to drive action. So I go back to uh, some of the initial work that we did very early on, and the good news is that the initial insights that we had um, hold true which is when we did our initial modeling, we found that the cases at the countywide level are um, far greater than our testing capacity um, uh, was indicating. We understood how important it was to rapidly show, slow down the spread of the disease to make sure that we do not run out of hospital capacity and that the biggest thing we could do to flatten that curve was ensure compliance with the public health order in order to save lives. All three of those insights which drove our action continue to be true, even as we've learned more about the disease and actually have real numbers rather than projections to go off of. So I wanna share a little bit of uh, the projections um, uh, and the actual numbers now that we have from the county that they've shared in some recent presentations and let you know uh, what they, we think of us. So this graph produced by the county shows at a high level the uh, number of cases both in Santa Clara County and by comparison, the uh, state of California as a whole. What you see here tells us that Santa Clara County is actually tracking in line with deaths per capita throughout California. That may not sound like much, but this is actually a pretty incredible achievement given that COVID-19 was here in Santa Clara County first. So we had the least time to prepare prepare and should have had the highest and steepest ramp up in the entire state. We didn't. We've kept it flat and we've kept it flat relative to other places which have much uh, less dense population and population centers that are at less risk than ours. 
for example, uh, deaths per capita in, Santa, in Los Angeles County are more than twice the rate of California overall, whereas we've been able to stay at the rate of California overall. So another look at that same number is the county's public facing COVID-19 dashboard. And what this shows is that we are flattening the curve and our trajectory is encouraging. New cases per day are declining, realizing that the last five days that data comes in slowly, so the last five days will be a little higher than what's displayed here. But they are declining and they have been for some time. And what that means is we are, as they say, flattening the curve. What is the result of this? Well, according to the county's own modeling, the estimate is that as we near the 60 day mark, we collectively have taken action as a community that has saved more than 8,400 lives. That's pretty incredible. Um, it is an odd space to be in because it's, 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 it's what has not happened that has been most important. And it's sometimes hard to, to feel that in the same way that we feel the things that have happened such as the economic stress that has been caused by the shelter in place and, and all of the other effects. But I think it is very important to note that the collective action of, of individuals across this city has been instrumental in saving literally thousands of lives in the last several weeks. However, we have had deaths and those deaths have been disproportionate in terms of affecting our most vulnerable communities. This picture in this chart brought from the Mercury News shows very clearly that the deaths are falling disproportionately on the east side and that about a third of the first 100 deaths in Santa Clara County are estimated to have occurred in just four zip codes, all of them in East San Jose. The rate of death in the poorer areas is four times higher than that of wealthy areas. And most notably, the areas with Latino populations are bearing the brunt of the impact with um, about 34% of the deaths uh, in the Latino community who represent only about 23% of the 18 and older population. All of this makes it clear that as we prepare for recovery, it is extremely important that we do this carefully to make sure that we do not exacerbate the conditions that are impacting our most vulnerable communities and that we come out of this in a way that has those communities at the heart of our work. So what do we see? What's, what's in the proverbial crystal ball? Well, there are a lot of different possible futures, and we actually don't know what shape the pandemic will take. Uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about the disease. We don't know to what extent it will, uh, like other coronaviruses, uh, slow down and um, almost disappear over the summer or not, and whether, like other coronaviruses, it'll come back in the fall and winter. Um, we don't know to what extent immunity is conferred by having had COVID-19 to future uh, strains of COVID-19. But we do know the path forward is going to be long and hard. Um, because we have done so well at preventing the deaths, it means we have a lot of our people in the community, the vast majority in the community, who have not been exposed to the disease. And so that means that when we come out of the place, that everybody who has not had the, the disease is once again at risk. And so until there's a vaccine, until it is scaled up, we are going to be in this in some form or another. And so we must prepare for the possibility of a resurgence and build the testing, tracing, and supported isolation capacity at the county level to be able to understand when that resurgence is coming. As an example here, we've included some of the charts of the deaths of the 1918 pandemic to show you how in this case, it actually had three waves. The first of which was the most mild, there was um, some uh, mutation in the uh, flu, uh, and the second wave was the, the, the most deadly, but that was followed by a third wave, which was also very significant and deadly. We don't know if this is a pattern that COVID will follow. This is similar to the pattern that other flu pandemics have followed, but it is very likely that if we come out of the shelter in place without maintaining protections, that we will see a rapid increase in the number of deaths and lose the ground that we have gained. So all of this is, is to say that we are still in this. This is a marathon, or as Lee and I like to say, a triathlon. It's a multi-sport event, um, some of which we're learning as we go, um, but it will require all of us to continue and to endure. I think, you know, and as Dr. Cody is quoted here as saying, it is only going to get harder. I think the, the positive note that I would end on is I believe we are capable of making it through this. Everything that I've seen about our organization 
has demonstrated to me that to a person we will respond and we will do what we can to mitigate the spread of this disease. And I believe we are going to make it out and we are going to make it out together. But it is not something that we're going to sw switch a light switch on and be done with. It is something we are going to work together through this triathlon, through this marathon over a long, difficult haul. With that, I will turn it back to Lee to walk through a little bit of our approach to um, some of the financing and funding aspects of this long haul recovery. Thank you. Thanks, Kip. And can uh, you go to the next slide for me? Thanks. So as Dave mentioned, several of us are going to be presenting uh, to you and, and just want to note uh, Jim Shannon's name is here, but I will uh, be trying to present his slides uh, to the best of my ability today so that he can focus on the, the overall proposed budget for the city. Um, you know, recovery means a lot of different things um, in the emergency management world. Um, however, we are going to focus a, a little bit on, oop, previous slide, Kip. Um, we are going to focus today um, on our, our financial and our fiscal recovery based off of questions last week. Um, and this will include how financial recovery typically works. And given that this event is very uh, different than, than previous events, our strategy for moving forward with an overall uh, you know, fiscal structure in place for this response. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our Director of Emergency Management, Ray Reardon. And you can go to the next slide, Kip. Thank you, Lee. Uh, good morning. I'm Ray Reardon, the Director of the City Manager's Office of Emergency Management. I'm also the Planning Section Coordinator in the Emergency Operations Center. As we begin to, dis to discuss financial recovery, we need to understand how it relates to the response uh, when activities take place and when the funding resources are available. <laughs> Today, I'm going to talk to you from my 34 years experience responding to 15 presidential emergencies and recovering from over 12 of those. I'd like to describe um, what I, I will call a typical response uh, to a presidentially declared emergency. It's important to understand you can have emergencies that are not declared by the president and there's a different process. I'll be focusing on the presidential declared emergencies. When an event happens, uh, like the Coyote Creek 2017 flood, the city of San Jose deployed resources to respond to the presented conditions with an effort to provide the best services and address the community facing issues like evacuation and sheltering. So that's represented in the boxes uh, to the left of the arrow response uh, in that effort. When we transitioned from response to recovery, it took place after the emergency was stabilized Inspectors conducted an initial damage estimate, and then state and federal inspectors followed us to confirm what the initial damage estimate identified. This all starts with the termination of the emergency, which is set a date set by the state, which signals, signals time to begin the recovery process. About six months after the flood, the city submitted project worksheets. So let's start to move into the green boxes to the right. Uh, we, we submitted the project worksheets around the standardized eight reimbursement categories from FEMA. After we submitted the project worksheets, state and federal recovery specialists scrutinized the worksheets to make sure that the justifications were correct and the documentation, documentation was complete. As work progresses, then the city provides progress reports to the state and the federal recovery specialists through a web portal. Sometimes we get caught in a cycle of denials from the state and federal specialists and we respond to requests for information to add more data. And other times we may, may receive a denial and start an appeal process. Once all the questions are addressed, funds are released after another review of documentation. For the 2017 Coyote Creek flood, we continue to get reimbursement funds. And this can stretch out for another year or two as we continue with the re reimbursement process. The funding and reimbursement process is managed at the state, at the staff level and reports to council presented uh, twice a year. With response to the pg e power shutoffs, the process was similar. However, uh, there was no presidential declaration. We responded to the emergency, recovery, recovered uh, shortly after the two outages, and we did submit the damages, in, initial damage assessment to the state and the county. But without that presidential declaration, the state assumed the recovery support by providing us a $500,000 grant direct, directly with a very simple application process. We currently have those funds to do planning and mitigation work prior to the next PS. We were able to work in short order as the response was complete and we could focus specific people on the recovery efforts. 
Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, COVID-19 presented the most impactful emergency local, state, federal, and global responders have ever seen. With this unprecedented emergency, the old way of response to recovery was modified. You can see with the two parallel lines that the collective we initiated recovery during the recovery, local, state, and federal assets all together. The state and federal agencies offered assistance early in the process, which was new, the first time in California this has been offered. FEMA even created an opportunity for expediting applications for funds. With, while the direction to allow for reimbursement of congregate and non-congregate care and food were issued, the detailed rules were being developed as they were offered during these for these expedited applications. The guidance continues to evolve. We do know that the two expedited packages we submitted have been thoroughly reviewed and we expect approval this week. That's two weeks after we submitted. That's record time. In order to keep the funds, however, we got to make sure our documentation is well prepared for any future audit. And the approval is only for the eligible product projects for which we have the authority to provide. We recognize there are other federal funding streams beyond FEMA and additional packages are being developed, which Ben will cover later in the presentation. The challenge has been in understanding what different eligible activity, activities qualify for the various funds. And Luz will cover that in her presentation. The shift of this front-loading recovery of resources has caused some uncertainty because not all the federal packages will follow the FEMA rules. As a result, we may have a lot of documentation to clean up later when more details of the guidance for each stream becomes more clear. We must also be prepared for any spike and any recovery, uh, and all the recovery will take time. As Kit mentioned, we'll respond as we can while returning to business in a safe manner. Back to you, Lee. Thank you, Ray. And you know, I just wanted to to, to thank Ray and his leadership uh, during this crisis. Tuesdays are a very busy day in the EOC as we do transitions, and he is responsible for um, kind of converting our emergency action plan from week to week on Tuesdays. So he's he's been very focused on two day, Tuesdays, and we haven't pulled him in. But um, you know, your dedication and and steadfast approach to ensuring that we've all been doing our training the past two years and and ensuring that the EOC runs um, an appropriate way has been really important. So thank you, Ray. Thank you. Um, as presented two weeks ago, um, our financial uh, recover recovery will be um, guided by three approaches. And do the recovery right. So this is um, continuing to focus on the most vulnerable and at-risk populations through this event. Second, uh, maximizing our reimbursement potential. So we will be maximizing our reimbursement potential by strategically matching the highest and best funding sources to the highest and uh, best eligible uses. And Luz will go into this in a second. And then lastly, and most importantly, minimize the general fund impact. With the economic crisis, um, while the economic crisis does affect all of our funds, as we focus on our at-risk and most vulnerable populations, the most powerful tool that we have is our city staff and our general fund to then support that community. Therefore, as we work together to recover from COVID-19, we'll use as many non-general fund resources, federal and state resources as appropriate. I'm gonna hand it over to Luz and where the rest of the presentation is gonna focus on number two and number three and how we're starting to do this initial work. Luz, over to you, next slide. Okay. Good morning, Mayor, Council members. You've already seen this waterfall graphic that demonstrates at a very high level how the city intends to apply various funding sources to COVID-19 related expenditures. As we said the last time you saw this, this waterfall approach first uses the most restricted funds, such as FEMA, then taps into monies that are less restrictive, such as the Corona Relief Funds, Coronavirus Relief Funds, or CRF. Finally, and last, and in this case, we are emphasizing the very least to be used are city funding sources, which includes the general fund. I will share with you that Julia Cooper and I were on a nationwide call yesterday with about 150 other big cities and counties who were direct recipients of CRF funds and also received significant deposits into their respective accounts in the last couple of weeks. I will also share that we all seem to have the same mixed emotions about the CRF advance both shared glee 
and sheer terror, as the guidelines were and continue to be fairly vague. Mm -hmm. Waterfall approach was also mentioned by others during that call, as a path forward to use all available funds, sources of funding in the most optimal manner. And we continue to work on a citywide strategic funding plan to best leverage all monies available to the city. Next slide, please. So this could also be a familiar graphic presented last week, which was presented last time. It provides insight of the most recently passed coronavirus relief package, which is CARES Act 3.0 in detail. The large purple bu bubble represents the entire CARES Act 3.0 program. This funding has proved to be very dynamic as individual federal agencies issue their notices of, fun of funding availability and opportunities to address their own particular priorities. Ever since last week, the city received, even since last week, the city received notice from the U.S. Department of Commerce of $1.5 billion in CARES Act funds to, quote, aid communities impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Again, fake. Uh, the city is directly eligible for this money and the city's Office of Economic Development is reviewing the terms and conditions for accessing and applying for these funds. Next slide, please. So remember a few slides ago, Ray mentioned that the challenge has been in understanding what a different eligible activities qualify. This illustrates just how challenging that analysis has become given all the different funding sources with different eligibility and reporting requirements and all the different uses. Let's take, for example, the bubble on the right, the food and necessities bubble, and that's up towards the top on your right-hand side of the screen. That use, or at least a portion of that use of food and necessities is eligible for FEMA public assistance, the FAA airport money, CRF money, and CDBG money. The hard part, the really, really hard part about this is making sure that we organize a citywide plan that we are, so we're getting the best bang for the buck and not duplicating benefits. That is getting paid for the same use twice. Frankly, this is just as complicated as it looks. And now I'll turn it over to Lee to provide a broad overview of the initial COVID-19 use strategy. Thanks, Luz. Uh, last week, Council inquired about the structure of the, the CARES Act and the allocation of the $178 million to the city. Um, and it's important to note the following, and I, th I think uh, we as staff have not done a good job. We've used um, a different terminology to, to talk through this, and, and typically the word that's been used by, by staff and discussed um, you know, with Council is the term reimbursement. And so I just want to kind of clarify three things so everyone is using the correct terminology, especially us, so that we can communicate clearly with the council. Reimbursement only applies to the FEMA program. And so typically, as Ray said, that is, you know, it's called reimbursement because it happens after the disaster and through the recovery process. In this case, FEMA has decided, uh, given the scope of the crisis, to advance some of that money. But we use the term reimbursement to only actually speak about um, FEMA. The second is the CARES Act. And typically, I think a lot of people have assumed the CARES Act is what gave us the 178 million direct deposit from the department or direct allocation from the Department of Treasury. And that is true, except the CARES Act is actually much larger. If, if, you, if you think about that bubble that Lou showed a few slides ago, the CARES Act is made up of several different things. It's the money we, um, received through the CDBG program, the ESG, the um, FEMA uh, public assistance, as well as the, the FAA support that the airport got. What also is included in the CARES Act is the Coronavirus Relief Fund, uh, or what we refer to as CRF. And that is what gave us our direct allocation from the Department of Treasury. So uh, we will be very crisp as we continue to talk through that with you. Um, one of the requests from Council last week is to better understand what does the structure of the Coronavirus Relief Fund look like and how we um, intend to um, bring forward the allocations of the $178 million. And so really quickly, the Coronavirus Relief Fund is, is basically structured into two halves. Um, and there's a response half and a recovery. And in the response, it talks about medical expenses that can be covered, as well as any public health uh, compliance uh, that needs to take place, as well as paying for our actual response and payroll expenses for that response 
as well as facilitating compliance with the public health order. And then quite frankly, it's, it's fairly vague thus far um, and has little money in the current package around economic support and recovery planning. Although it looks like a lot of that is taking shape in the, the next CARES Act, which Ben will speak to in a second. Next slide. And it, you know, it's, it's important to note as we start to look at this, um, that we do not actually intend to ever have a discussion with the council mm -hmm. on just the coronavirus relief fund. It's important to note, given all of the under all of the other funding sources that Lou's referenced, as well as the evolving guidelines and the complexity of matching all of the sources, the administration uh, believes that a discussion at a higher level, so a discussion around the COVID-19 source and use or overall budget, is is a much better conversation and better maximizes our reimbursement potential and also better protects the general fund. This past week, the EOC, the Budget Office and Finance Department have worked to, to put together rough estimates and develop a use strategy, not a source of use, but a use strategy that contemplates continuing operations through the end of the calendar year. This piece, along with the analysis that Luz and team are doing will ultimately lead to the overall source and use in the coming weeks that we'll return to council on. Um, I wanna outline a few different things. So how we got to these numbers. I wanna provide a, a kind of broad perspective here. And we arrived at these at a very high level by extrapolating where applicable uh, to estimate expenses through the calendar year and look at burn rates or where we had additional, or monthly burn rates or where we had additional uh, information um, we were able to plug um, in into this model. However, I do wanna mention that at this point in time, these numbers as assume that we continue to respond as we are responding through the end of the calendar year. As Kit mentioned, we don't yet know what's in store for us and we don't yet know what we will scale down or what we will scale up um, and what additional needs may come as the situation changes. Second, I want to talk about the, how these estimates are evolving. Um, obviously the crisis continues to change. We will refine our numbers as we continue, as Ray mentioned, the documentation process to follow up and get additional detail. Um, I do wanna mention a few things on how these numbers will change as well. Uh, Luz did mention the, the package um, um, from FEMA earlier on in the presentation. So these numbers represent what's all in on the use side. It does not contemplate or take money out for what we have in for FEMA reimbursement thus far. So our initial, request for FEMA reimbursement or what we believe we will get for food distribution in the first 30 days is $3.7 million. As well as on the PPE side or the and, and facility compliance um, overall, we have a $2 million uh, reimbursement request in for the first 30 days. So th those will change these numbers as well. Um, also important to note that uh, small business funding, um, very little money uh, specifically out or earmarked for it in the CARES Act, or I'm sorry, the Coronavirus Relief Fund. However, Department of Commerce has just released 1.5 billion in funds, um, and we are cobbling together other funding sources and future packages uh, to put money into that bucket for the long-term recovery. In addition, future funding um, uh, potential around a CARES Act 4.0, um, as well as additional policy changes or revenue um, changes from FEMA could change these numbers as well. And then lastly, uh, reimbursement from the county and city jurisdictions will draw down on these amounts as well. But as you can see, the overall budget and new strategy for this response is quite vast. And it's important that we have the conversation in totality and not just one funding pot at a time, because if we have that siloed policy, and budget allocation conversation, it will take tools away from us to maximize that reimbursement and protect the general fund. To talk a little bit about future funding packages and how these numbers um, may be offset, I will turn it over to Benna Chang, our Director of Intergovernmental Relations. Good morning, everybody. Next slide, please. So first, just wanted to um, remind Council that this is a very complicated picture as we've been talking about this morning. We focused a lot this morning on how complicated it is for the city itself, but obviously we're working with many partners on the response uh, side as well, and they all have their own individual funding sources and programs that they are uniquely qualified to compete for. So just as an example, we took a look on the screen 
about the various food distribution funding sources that are in the CARES Act and then also some state funding. You'll see here that some of the, the funding from the CARES Act around food went to some of our partners or that our partners are better able to compete and qualify for, including Santa Clara County and the food banks. So we are working right now with those partners, including Second Harvest Food Bank, the County Office of Education, and the county itself, to refine a comprehensive food funding strategy. And really, again, to help everyone maximize the funding sources. More funding to our region obviously benefits everybody. Next slide, please. So it's been a big morning this morning for IGR, a lot going on both at the federal and state levels in regards to additional recovery uh, support. So the biggest news this morning is that the House Dems released their proposal for the fourth federal stimulus package just before 10 o'clock Pacific today. It's called the HEROES Act and it is a big, big package. So the IGR team will be working throughout this week to do some more deeper analysis on the package. But so far, it looks very much like a CARES Act 2.0 or part two. There's a lot of funding in there for many of the things that the city cares about, including additional food support, SNAP, WIC, child nutrition programs, additional rental assistance, homelessness support, homeowners assistance. Um, very importantly for the city, there is a proposal from the House Democrats to add $375 billion to local governments, including cities and counties. Um, there's more support for testing vaccines, et cetera. So again, the, the team will be digging a little bit more into the bill and will provide some additional analysis. I do wanna mention that this is a negotiation. So we do not expect this to be the final package that Congress comes up with. Um, we have heard from the Senate Republicans that they want to take a slower, more cautious approach and that they want to look at something maybe around the Memorial Day time frame. So the road ahead for this package is uncertain and it could potentially be long, but I uh, wanted to just give Council an update on some of the recent actions. Uh, we will again take a deeper look into the HEROES Act, but we have been hearing that infrastructure and a serious job stimulus and job creation would not be part of this next package. Uh, so we anticipate that there will be additional packages in the future that really address that. Finally, at the state level, uh, we expect the governor to release his May revise soon. As you have all heard in the news, the state budget picture is pretty bleak. Uh, we've heard different numbers on how bad the budget hole will be. I think a lot of it is due to the uncertainty in the economy. Um, and it's hard to model what that um, economic recovery might look like at this point. So we've heard numbers as high as $54 billion for the shortfall and as low as $18 billion. So the Assembly Budget Committees are meeting soon, starting next week, to really talk about adopting what I'm calling a budget of cuts by June 15th. You might remember they had some discussion previously about doing a baseline budget in June. Um, but it's really looking like the assembly wants to look at what kinds of services they can scale back now to kind of uh, reduce their budget obligations. And then the Senate also just released a proposal this morning uh, with two key packages in it. One is additional renter landlord stabilization. So this would be landlord tax credits and renter relief. And then two, a $25 billion economic recovery fund. So this is an idea of allowing voters to prepay taxes so the state could have some additional revenue and to use that additional revenue now on economic stimulus. So a package of infrastructure, homelessness support, uh, worker retraining types of programs. So I haven't looked at that language yet, but with the Senate Democrats have just released it. We'll be taking a look at that a little bit more. Um, I think it's fair to say that the state is in a very tough financial position this year. Uh, it's facing a lot of the declining revenues like the city is as well. So it's most likely that we will be working with them on policy related changes versus um, additional budget asks at this point. The one exception to that is there's also been some conversations about potential um, voter bonds that might be going forward in November and response to the pandemic. And we're hearing a lot of things about what might go into that, including climate change, resiliency types of projects, as well as infrastructure projects. So with that, we'll turn it back over to Lee. Thanks, Benna. And uh, this is our last slide. So 
Uh, we will be continuing to evaluate all of the funding options in the coming weeks and better understanding those restrictions. The, the last thing we want to do um, is put the, the council and the, the city in general in a situation at the end of the year where we owe money back to the federal or state government. Um, we'll be ensuring that we continue our, our, cost me our cost tracking mechanisms within the EOC so that we can maximize these reimbursement um, uh, sources. And then lastly, as so that we can align um, and, and better operationalize all this work in the context of the city's overall budget, um, we'll be doing year-end budget transactions that'll be led by Jim Shannon. And this will be focused on replenishing the general fund to the extent possible once we re receive uh, FEMA reimbursements into the emergency. Uh, res uh, reserve and also uh, allocation costs uh, between our coronavirus relief fund, the emergency fund, and any other city funds as appropriate. Um, in the coming weeks, we will be building out that overall source and use to the extent possible, knowing that it will be a uh, continuing to evolve as additional guidelines and funding pots come in, but get that, get that to a point where we understand where all those arrows are going. And with that, Dave, I will turn it back over to you. That concludes staff's presentation. Yeah, thanks, Lee, and thank you to the whole team. Um, so Mayor and Council, we're ready for any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks to everybody uh, for the report, and thanks, more importantly, for all the hard work. Um, I wanted to uh, let folks know we're now at noon. Uh, I was going to suggest we take our break at 1230 and return at 1.30, does that make sense? Okay, uh, I, uh, Councilman Esparza, you had your hand raised and then you took it down. Is, did you want to speak or was that Exto? Okay, I'll go to Council Member Prellis. Thanks, Mayor. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed, did you say we were gonna take a break momentarily or how well, are we? We'll take a break at 12.30 uh, and okay. we're putting out we're going to try out this 10 minute limit. So we should be able to get through three, three council members at least. Okay. Got it. So, uh, my question was in regards to, uh, one of the slides, pull it up now, that the, the CARES Act 3.0 slide that talks about some of the funding that we still need to apply for. Um, there was one listed as firefighter assistance and um, just curious any more details on that. Um, I know that obviously we, that was some of our first city employees that we knew publicly that were uh, you know, infected and um, we incurred, uh, I think a good number of overtime uh, costs because of that. And so I'm just curious, is that something, is there gonna be a nexus there or what is that firefighter assistance um, funding for? I would ask, uh, yeah, Luz, it looks like you're coming online. She's best to explain. Actually, that. I'm going to defer to Benna because she's a little bit closer to that particular funding source and has more information. But frankly, there's quite a bit of money available across all particular funding pots for um, public safety. I mean, that is quite frankly low-hanging fruit, for, for lack of a better word. So, so while those two pots of money, which I believe add up to $135 million, are uh, going to be available and they will be applying for them. There's also other sources of money for, for that particular effort. Uh, yes, so I know that our fire department is looking very closely at that particular program. There is additional supplemental money that came from the CARES Act and I will pull up some of the additional details on that and we can tell you a little bit more about what that could fund. Just give me a moment and I'll come back to you. Sorry. Okay, I have a second question. So while Ben is looking up that, um, this is, in, and maybe this might take a little research as well, um, but this one's in regards to a, a second bubble there, the economic development as well, uh, noted as need to apply. And um, I'm just curious as well, same, same sort of question would be, uh, what are the, you know, abilities uh, that we may have to be able to utilize that um, as we are uh, attempting to right, embark on the beginnings now of, of economic recovery and just to try and identify what that might look like and if there are resources for things like that. Um, you know, there's a, a proposed memo from the mayor and Councilmember Davis right in regards to one potential idea. The, the thought could be there could be a lot of those um, suggestions 
And I know that one still implied that, uh, for instance, right, somebody would have to cover that cost of whatever it may take to close down streets. Could, you know, some of these dollars be used for things like that? So if you can answer that as well. Thanks. Go back to the firefighter grant question. So the eligible activities under that solicitation include PPE, some supplies to prepare and um, prevent and respond to COVID-19, and then includes reimbursement for expenditure since January 1st of 2020. So just additional detail on that one. And on your second uh, question, Council Member Perales, uh, the EDA, which is the economic development arm of the federal government, has in a set of investment priorities, and they're listed to provide an overarching framework to guide the agency's investment portfolio. And basically it talks about recovery and resilience projects, uh, critical infrastructure. Um, so for example, they make mention about physical thing, physical items such as broadband, energy roads, water sewer, workforce development and manufacturing and opportunity zones. And so the Office of Economic Development, I am certain will be coming back to you with more information on that as they're researching that project. And if I can just j jump in on that as well, council member, I think, you know, the, I guess what is CARES 2.0 is now HEROES. Um, there, obviously that got released about an hour ago. There is potential funding for small business support as well as what Benna mentioned is a future funding package around infrastructure and job creation that will also have some type of local business assistance. So I think that'll be a topic that we continue to come back. Obviously there's a few different referrals on and very important. And I would also point out, you know, as Benna mentioned at the state level, uh, advocacy around dollars is probably not going to be uh, worthwhile at the state level, given their own limitations with their budget. However, as we start to rethink about reopening our economy, there are a lot of policy um, questions and, and decisions that we can ask the state to help with as well. So that, that the Office of Economic Development will be conducting that analysis over the next few weeks. Okay, thank you. And any update on the small business grant program as far as tallies on, um, you know, how many people have already applied and, and if you can just restate to me again, how many we expect to provide, I think it was 100 and something. Um, and then the deadline is this Sunday, if you just re re respond to that. Sure. Um, yeah, so it looks like we're anticipating the capacity for uh, um, 142 grants. And the deadline is Sunday, May 17th, base 11.59 p.m. I don't, have the, any, I don't have any information on what's come in so far. Um, was there a, a, a cap on the dollar amount? That's why we had the 142 grants, and what's that cap? Yeah, the uh, cap of $10,000. And no, no, no info yet then on who's, or how many people have applied, or how many businesses? Uh, yeah, no, I don't have any infor information. We don't yet, no. Okay, that was it, thanks. Thank you. Um, Council Member Arenas? So sorry. Um, thank you. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Dave, for continuing to um, highlight our our heroes, our own local heroes. I'm really um, grateful for that. And so thank you for our employees to um, continuing to, to do the great work that they are doing. My question is, um, now I heard, uh, I think it was Lee, you're the one who was covering it. Maybe it was Kip, I apologize. But I did hear the overrepresentation of Latinos um, impacted by COVID. Um, we've seen that even across California, not just locally here. And so I'm, I'm guessing that what we're going to do with knowing that that's part of the data set that that's going to guide us, that our recovery plan will have specific strategies. Um, have you thought of what those look like? Um, when will you present those to us? Council member, very good question. Yes, exactly. We want to make sure that our recovery plan is based on where the most risk is and quite clearly the, the risk for people who are working, uh, people, especially people who are working in essential services, public employees is very high. And a lot of those folks are 
Latino and a lot of the communities that our uh, Latino neighbors live in are more crowded and, and more at risk for a lot of reasons. So we are taking that into account as we are developing the recovery strategies. It's very much in the forefront of our thinking and our planning. We are right now beginning that shift and that pivot from a high level response to a sustained recovery. And so over the next weeks and frankly months, we'll both be developing and deploying different pieces of that recovery strategy. We'll continue to use uh, 3.1 to bring back uh, the strategies as we develop them over the course of the next several weeks. And it, it, to the extent we have specific items that require uh, council action and direction, we'll bring those back as as uh, clear items. So at this point, we are still developing the plan internally as, as we also take action. So um, the, the bottom line is we'll come back periodically and keep you informed and also engaged as we develop that strategy. Well, I would assume as we are moving forward that we would keep that also in mind as we're approving um, items later on in the agenda as well. Um, and I'd like to also have us point that out and have it as a, a um, as something that is absolutely factored into our recovery, our economic recovery, as you've stated, Kip, that um, there's a lot of uh, Latinos in the service industry. And so I don't know um, if it's because of, uh, you know, the living conditions in terms of uh, being overcrowded, that's probably one. Um, but I'm also guessing that it's also lack of insurance or lack of access to uh, health insurance and lack of access to maybe some time off um, versus, you know, they have to decide whether they can take time off or keep working because there is no other source of, of uh, funding for them. Um, so I like for us to consider all of those, which is our issues that I have been bringing up for the last couple of weeks. Um, and thank you, Kip, for following up. Uh, in between meetings um, about some of those issues. I know some of them haven't been, you know, tied up um, with a pretty ribbon or anything, but I appreciate that you're uh, beginning to look into them. Um, um, and as we have, we're seeing data, we can't really dispute that we also must um, tailor our strategies in San Jose, um, within the city of San Jose and within our economic recovery to take into account what's happening with our Latino population. Thank you. Thank you. And I look forward to to you coming back with some of those strategies and having them really concrete so we can uh, review them um, and contribute to them. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, Councilmember Jimenez. Yeah. Thank you. My my question is more general. Um, you know, we've been we've been having these Zoom meetings for what seems to be some time, maybe about a month and a half or so, maybe two months even. What I'm curious about is I'm hoping someone can take me through the thought process on how we move back to having in-person meetings. Uh, as we go forward discussing a lot of this important stuff, uh, it's not lost on me that uh, this, this uh, format of meetings uh, it does present some challenges for the community to be uh, very sort of integrated in some of the thought process and comments and such. And so what I'm curious about is, do we know when we're going to revert back to having an in-person meeting, maybe having a segregated sort of room for, for the public to be in or, or separating the chairs as we did at some point in the chambers? I'm not, I'm not sure who can answer that or, or what. Dave, I'm just, I think Dave's mute. trying to answer, but he's on mute. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, council member. Um, it's okay. anyway, um, so I'll start with, with trying to answer that. You know, I think, as we've talked about before, um, you know, there's going to be uh, an incremental uh, modification to the public health orders, um, you know, over time. And so we've, that's what we've been talking about. You know, from my personal standpoint, I, I, I would assume that, you know, large public gatherings are going to be something that are, are kind of not in our near future. Um, and even our ability to be able to manage public gatherings in a, in a way that maintains social distancing is also going to, I think, be something that's uh, not necessarily in our near future. Um, and so, um, you know, that's kind of my take on it. I don't know if Kip or, or Lee have any more, uh, you know, background or, or information yeah. you'd like to share. I mean, Dave, I, th I think you hit on it well. Just one of the things that we haven't uh, shared with the council is, 
is last week the emergency operations center started uh, an exercise with all the departments that we referred to as unpacking the coop or the the continuity of operations plan so departments are now starting to work through you know stages six seven eight nine that we've showed you and and how we would reopen city hall and start to bring back some of the services um, and part of that exercise will be the EOC working with um, the clerk and, and obviously facilities on, on what type of meetings can take place within City Hall, but we will be <clears throat> guiding that work by what is the safest for those taking place in that work, and then what are the resources that it needs to take to bring back that function, because we could be quickly overwhelmed with some of the logistical work around some of those large gatherings or, or even bringing back certain uh, programs. So I, I'd say there's more to come on that. And I, I would like to see if Kip has anything, you know, I think in my own mind, and I'm just talking out loud, uh, even when I think the, the, the shelter in place order is lifted, I would assume there's still going to be restrictions on, um, you know, gatherings and, and other functions in the public. Um, so I, that's, that's how I think we, we anticipate it playing out. But Kip, you want to add anything? I think you're correct, Dave. I think public gatherings of, of large numbers of people will be one of the very last things that gets added back on. I think a, a little bit of math for fun. Um, one of the things to think about is it's a combination of, of, of proximity and duration. So the closer that people are together and the longer they are together, without protective equipment, especially especially the higher the risk. And so, the typical way that we do community meetings, especially ones which are very engaged and take a half day, are exactly what you want to avoid in terms of, of putting people at risk. It ha further has the disadvantage of bringing people from different pods together and then sending them back. So it, it's sort of the trifecta of, of, of threats of proximity, duration, and mixing of individuals that, that creates a significant public health hazard, which is why they were among the very first things prohibited even before we did the shelter in place. There are ways to mitigate that, and there are ways to uh, lower those risks, and we will do all of those as we come back. But in the meantime, the very safest way to do it is not to be in the same room with everybody. So it is, it is likely that we will continue, certainly on, on the working side, using Zoom and other technologies for quite some time, because that is by far the safest way to do the work. And, and, you know, so, so I appreciate all that. I guess I'm trying to think back to the way we conducted some of the initial meetings as we started sort of venturing down the path of going fully on Zoom. It seems to me that at some point we did do this hybrid of sorts where some folks were allowed in but separated and they, you know, taped off certain chairs with, you know, in close proximity to each other. Is that, I mean, would we, as we move forward through these stages, would we eventually start doing that before we actually fully opened up again? Uh, or, 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 you know, I, I would say, council member, I, I don't know. You know, I think, you know, when we uh, did the shutdown process, um, I think we were all racing to try to figure out how to comply with the orders. And, and, and certainly, I think we all ended up re, uh, finding, you know, this technology solution. Um, you know, and so now that we have this solution, I, I think there's, as Kip is saying, we're going to be really, um, I, I would say universally uh, wanting to err on the side of safety, recognizing that even with this technology solution, there are shortcomings and, and, and access issues. So that no dispute on that at all. Um, but I, you know, I, I think that uh, those measures that we employed during that time were in essence stopgap measures until we could figure out a better way of complying with the orders. Okay, do we have a guesstimate as to when you think uh, Kip or, or Dave, when we would start venturing down the road and having these public meetings again, or are we thinking like next year? Like what stage, for example, would we have that? Is it the latter? I mean, you know, after we've gone through the, the, the cycle of stages uh, yeah. and that would eventually be the outcome? In our nomenclature, you know, where we have stage six, seven, and eight as the next next three stages, I'm I'm hopeful that by the time we get to stage eight, which is the most normal stage before a vaccine, that we could have some limited way of doing in-person engagement that, that respected the social distancing. But that could be a while. 
Um, and and as, uh, as the city manager said, we just really don't know. We have stood up a fully functioning branch that's working on virtual community engagement, and they are thinking through things like hybrid questions. How do you, how do, for example, how do you provide access to people who don't have access to the internet so that they can engage? How do you use nonprofits or uh, uh, locations out in the community where people could attend at much, much lower densities? And so I think mm -hmm, mm -hmm, those are all mm -hmm. things we're thinking through. And I think you'll see that more at the community level uh, before you see it back in City Hall, just because of the complexity of, of, of some of uh, the work here and the way council chambers are arrayed. But I would see that more in stage eight than stage six or seven in our nomenclature. Okay. Yeah, and thank you for that. I'm glad someone's working on that. I mean, the one thing that comes to mind for me, and certainly I haven't thought this through all that uh, deeply, but uh, even, you know, to a certain extent, maybe even having one library in each district sort of showing the, 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 the meeting and have access or providing people access to a certain extent to provide questions or to watch it live, assuming they don't have access to the internet and such. And so um, I'd like to hear more about that as, as, as that team sort of works through some of it, because I think it's very important that we provide as much as, access as possible to everyone uh, in the community, irrespective of uh, you know, whether they have access to a computer or the internet. I think it's very important. Yeah, thank, thank you, you council member. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Foley. Great, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation once again and always enlightening. I just actually have a couple of questions. One is for Benna. Benna, you mentioned the Landlord Stabilization Program or tax credits. I Can you tell me what the status is that part of the mayor or the governor's may revise? No, oh, sorry, just to clarify, that's part of the Senate Democrats proposal that they released today. Okay. So we'll be getting more details on that. I'm happy to share that with Council as well. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, then uh, another question for I'm not sure who regarding the small grant program. We um, are planning on uh, spend uh paying out 142 grants or so as long as the funds have uh, last is this the fund that is targeting specific zip codes but we are accepting applications from any small business in the city is that correct dave now i'm gonna ask i want to make sure i get this right i think i see kim jumped on so i'm gonna let her respond yeah hi hi everybody um yeah, it's, it's open to businesses that meet the following criteria. So the business must be located in the city of San Jose. The business owner must have a low or moderate income below 80% of the area median income. And they must have five or fewer employees. So any business in the city can apply, but we have done some proactive targeted outreach yesterday to districts um, that have those below 80% of the area median income sort of characteristics. But the application is open to, to any business that wants to apply. And then, okay, thank you. Uh, how many applications do you actually expect to receive and who's vetting and how complicated of a process is it for a small business owner and can a sole proprietor uh, uh, apply for the funds whether they have employees or not, like a hairdresser or such? Yeah, the application was designed with the Opportunity Fund, which is our partner, which has a lot of experience working with the very small micro businesses. So there, it, there is a, a set of information that most small business owners should have um, that they need to um, submit, but it's, it's a quite simple application. And um, the, the business must have five employees full-time equivalent or fewer. So I believe that a sole proprietor um, could, could apply because that's a unique form of micro business where they don't have any employees, but they right. have more than five. Okay, great. Uh, we're we're uh, distributing that information too, and it's helpful to have any background information in case we get asked the questions. Thank great. you. Yeah, I, I think that like all of our pots of money, it will go quickly once the word gets out because there is a tremendous amount of need out there. Out there. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm just I getting a, a solid confirmation from my lifeline here that sole proprietors can definitely apply. Okay, wonderful. Good, good to know. And then one final question. I think someone might have answered this, but I missed part of it. So we're talking about reentry. When uh, is it likely that we'll be able to reenter our council offices? When, when does that normalcy take place? Or what's that look like? Yeah, so the team is definitely working on those things. You know, certainly, um, you know, we're, I would expect to see a modification of the public health orders. Um, you know, how we operationalize that is what the team is working on in terms of physical improvements that would happen here in City Hall, any schedule changes that we would need to make to stagger, um, you know, people coming into the building. So there's a lot to it. Um, you know, I, I don't know what phase that, that puts us in in, in, in terms of um, our phasing. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, it's, it's not in our current phase, um, but hopefully a, a future and look at that. Just to kind of, um, you know, my own perspective, um, you know, what, what's going to happen, I believe, is as, as we uh, reopen the economy and allow people to come back to work, it, it's going to be very focused on, on activities where people cannot work from home and making sure that we're facilitating those that need to get back to work where they can't, they can't do that. And those that can work from home, I think uh, I would see a scenario where we try to facilitate that for, for as long as possible, uh, just so that we're, um, you know, being able to kind of continue to um, support the efforts of, of reducing the spread. Great, thank you. Uh, that, that's the end of my questions, but uh, again, I just want to Thank you all for the tremendous work that you're doing at the EOC and keeping us informed and responding to all the balls in the air that are hoping that we're not dropping anything, but certainly I am grateful and appreciative of the work that you're all doing. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Member um, Esparza, if you don't mind uh, interrupting your questions at around 1230 to take a break, you might, you wanna get started and then we'll take a break. Sure, okay, um, oops, let me move this, there we go. Um, sure, thank you. Um, and uh, so I'll start with, I think maybe the quicker one, which is um, I had some questions around testing. Um, I have also spoken or raised this as an issue with the county and uh, plan to have some more discussions with them. Um, because of the Mercury News article that highlighted that more than a third of the first hundred deaths are in four zip codes, two of which I represent. Um, and uh, so in physically going around, looking at some of the testing sites, I've noticed that many are not full. In fact, um, some are desperately trying to get people to come to their sites. Um, there's also, a disconnect in terms of who can go where and what is covered. I have noticed an increase in some of the sites are asking for health insurance to pay for the cost of the test, certainly not all of them. Um, and so um, I wanted to ask a question on one, the strategy around testing site placement and two, how we as a city can support the efforts um, these testing efforts and how to message it out to people um, and how to sort of aggregate all of this information in one place. I'll take that. I'm sorry. I was just jotting some notes. I was, uh, so I think a very good question and a very tough question. So we are in partnership with the county on this or attempting to be in partnership with the county on this in the sense that they are very much the lead on the testing, tracing, and supported isolation functions with the city supporting each of those aspects to, to different degrees. Our primary role in the testing at this point is to help the provision of sites when, when the county is ready to stand up a new site and around the engagement piece. So I think it's, I think your question is very relevant both to the county and, and to, to an extent us as well. I think there's at least three aspects to what you said, I, I think are important. One is what's the service delivery model, um, which is how, how can people access this? How easy is, is it to access? Um, is it available by, do you have to have an appointment? Can you walk up? Do you have to be in your car? That's one question. 
uh, to who can get served at each of the various sites. Do you have to be a certain category of worker? Do you have to have health insurance? Um, and then that leads to the third piece is how do you find out about this and, and how do you know? So I think at this point, it's a bit of a mosaic um, that is not co easily comprehensible to, to uh, a casual user or even a pretty well-informed user about where they should go and, and what they're going to have to pay. So I think part of the conversation that we've been having with the county is, you know, how can we help simplify and clarify the user experience and how can we do both uh, uh, engagement at the community level and also uh, public information to help people understand where they go, ideally with more of a one-stop feel to it. So these are both challenges that are on us and that we have extended a, a request to the county that we engage with them, especially around the communications aspect of it. But it's, it's, um, it's very difficult. The, the sites are changing on a daily basis, um, mm -hmm. and as are some of the regulations. So I don't mean to be at all dismissive of the question. I, I just acknowledge that we are having trouble with exactly the issues that you've raised. If, if I could add, I think um, you know, certainly um, this, um, we've talked quite a bit with the, the county on this in the, in the call that the mayor and I have with them. Um, and I know the mayor has been on point for really trying to make sure we understand the strategy. Um, you know, I, I think we've heard that all, the, all testing should be free. Um, there, there shouldn't be any requirements around that. So we need to really confirm that. Um, we've also, I think, heard that um, the, the criteria should be loosening to, to who, can, who can get the testing. Um, so we need to kind of understand that. So all, all very good questions. Um, you know, I do think that, um, you know, we've also been trying to, and it was, this was in the mayor's memo, try to understand really what the, what is the goal? What is the target for the number of testing that we should be, you know, trying to achieve here in the, in the county? Um, so all very good questions and, and very much a work in progress, although I do think there is progress being made. Um, so I, I think that is, uh, I just wanted to add that bit of information. As far as far as I know, we've got to take a break. Uh, okay. Could, could I just also offer one other little bit of information? Because I think your question is super important. Uh, first, there has been a challenge, I think, around building a strategy countywide. The good news is now Dr. Marty Spencer Scheib is... Uh, come out of retirement. He's a miserable failure in retirement, but clearly a very successful leader in public health. And I talked to him this morning. He oh, understands good. that we are eager to move, and he very much grasps this fundamental issue, which is we're not testing at capacity at many of these sites, which are very much in the east side. And we have, you know, one state side at, at James Lick. We've got one, obviously, at the county fairgrounds when it, uh, at PAL, there's no reason why we should not be driving many more people. And having, you know, you, you may, I don't expect you to follow my social media, but we've been trying to get the word out about the fact this is free, um, et cetera. Um, having your help and the help of all of our colleagues, getting that word out, this is free testing at these Verily sites and many other sites as well, um, that hopefully will help drive more numbers. Why don't we take your next question and on when we come back after break? Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. We'll take a recess and return at one thirty. Thank you, everybody.
restart the video. I'm told that I can't restart my video because the what? host has stopped it. Um, Oh, can you do that? Okay, I take that back, Tony. We're gonna ask Henry to do that. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the box is checked that says allow panelists to start video. Oh, goody. All right. Hey, I'm back. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay, uh, I think uh, Councilmember Sparza had the floor. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And so um, I actually just wanted to make one more point about testing before moving on to the second thing that I wanted to bring up. And that is that um, I think so in my district, uh, we have both Verily sites and other private sites coming up. And I think um, as the market grows to meet the need, we're going to continue to see more um, entities get into the testing space. And um, so I think it's important to kind of get a handle on that now, particularly as some of the new ones coming in are asking for health insurance, which I think is a key um, difference between some of the other sites that we're seeing um, and some of the new ones. So I just wanted to add that, um, that last comment about testing. Um, and then uh, I also wanted to bring up the recent Mercury News article that showed that um, 95116 nine five one two two nine five one two seven and nine five one four eight collectively represented the um over a third of the first hundred deaths um uh, due to covid and those are all located in the east side um and it's clearly a trend and i wanted to ask that this be included in the future um, as we uh, come up with ways to address the needs in the community that we talk about this. Between this and the recent San Francisco study that found that 90% of the cases, COVID cases there, were due to people who were unable to shelter in place and stay home. Um, and, uh, and 95 of those survey uh, of those cases were Latino in San Francisco. And so um, clearly there's a trend and I think that we need to um, develop a response to address that need, particularly as we reopen. Um, and I know it is not a switch that is flipped, that reopening will be a process. Um, it may even be two steps forward, one step back. We don't know what that means and what that looks like. But however we move forward as a city, we must, we must address trends like this. Um, it should not be acceptable to anybody at the city or anywhere else that these kinds of trends exist. And we see correlations amongst other needs as in food, as we're gonna discuss later. Um, and then I wanted to ask, as this comes up in the future, um, I think um, that is a conversation and that we, um, for some of, the, especially for some of these more complicated topics, that we really don't limit um, council member questions and comments because as we move forward into demobilization, I'm sure there will be a lot of questions about finance. There will be a lot of questions about business um, and other things that I think um, we will need the time to really give that the attention that it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Davis. Thank you, Mayor. I just had one question. Um, Kip, have you seen any numbers on the recoveries for Santa Clara County? I've noticed in the paper other um, counties, when, when we have the statewide numbers, other counties are reporting recoveries, but Santa Clara County isn't. Do you know anything about why that might be? Uh, I, I don't have any information about recoveries. We just done a quick check. I don't think they are, um, they certainly aren't reporting that out uh, apparently on their dashboards yet. I'm not, I'm not sure of the reason of that, uh, honestly, um, what the decision has been to, to not report on that. I think I actually find that information very useful. Um, it, you have to balance it with, you have to, you know, understand that only a portion of the cases are going to be recovered and obviously that takes time but ultimately that helps you understand what the actual um, death rates are are the rates uh, uh, versus of, t of testing versus death and so it's a very useful number uh, I can follow up and, and inquire with our county colleagues on 
um, on that and see if they would be open to adding that in. But I, I'm not sure why they've chosen not to re not to report that. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco. Yes, thank you so much. <clears throat> um, well, uh, again, thank you so much for this, uh, for, for the report. I'm going to make my, I'm going to try and speak as quickly as possible so I don't make up uh, a lot of lost time. Uh, a couple of things that I really want to get at, and, you know, it, uh, this conversation really shifted for me when the article uh, came out uh, with very alarming statistics. And there are some of us that overlap those, those zip codes uh, that, that Council Member Sparza just quoted. And, and uh, I think uh, Council Member Arenas also uh, made mention and Council Member Perales. And, and I, it, there's no secret because I think Council Member Perales actually also represents 95110, which is the uh, other zip code that was also um, was reported to have one of the highest number of uh, COVID deaths uh, in the county. What I, what I really want to emphasize is the following. Council member Esparza mentioned that of the first 100 cases, over a third were in those four zip codes. I want to really emphasize, not in the city, in the entire county of over 2 million folks. In the entire county, they were on the east side of San Jose. So as we move forward and we look at how devastated our budget is going to be, I hope that we can really consider that when we're making these budgetary decisions and we're making devastating cuts, and I'm not blind to the fact that we are going to be in a whole world of pain, that we uh, do not continue uh, uh, my apologies, there's a lot going on, a lot of activity going on in this household, uh, but that we can uh, really look at how we're going to um, make sure that uh, those communities that have been hit the hardest by COVID-19, uh, and those, and by the way, those are also the communities that we've been talking about that have been disenfranchised, that are still not connected, uh, children that have not been able to get online and continue to uh, uh, do their online learning for many reasons, including myself, and that's why my video is not on because there's there's so many folks right now uh, on uh, online trying to do a little bit of learning. They have other Zoom meetings going on, um, but uh, that when we look at library hours being reduced, when we look at our community center programming being reduced, when we look at our after school uh, programming being reduced, that we really look at these communities that have been ravished by COVID-19, that we make sure that at the very least, we keep our services um, as, as intact as possible in, uh, on the east side of San Jose. Uh, the, the other thing that I, I want to um, uh, touch upon is testing. I'm very concerned about testing. Uh, if we know, and we've known this, that the that that we don't know much about COVID-19 other than we don't have a vaccine, we don't have a cure, it's highly contagious, it spreads like wildfire. Well, we have a hotbed and we have all of the prime uh, uh, elements on the east side to make sure that COVID-19 is alive and well. We live in overcrowded conditions. We have individuals that are unable to shelter in place because of uh, economic reasons and because uh, those are the folks that uh, make it possible for the rest of us to stay home and shelter in place. And so if we know that and we've known that, then why are we not doing everything and anything that we can within our power to test individuals so that we can either isolate them or keep them away from work as quickly as humanly possible, keep them away from our seniors, keep them away from kiddos, um, and, and, uh, and pour resources as quickly as possible, whether it's in partnership with our nonprofits or with the county. And so one of the questions that I have is, 
uh, and um, Council Member Esparza brought it up. We're not up to capacity in our test sites. We need to do more outreach. We need to bring down whatever barriers uh, and punch through whatever bureaucratic uh, systems that continuously uh, build up and maintain those barriers up from folks that have already been systematically left out. So for example, at PAL, you can't have an appointment without having internet access because the appointments are made through the internet. So let's take that down, tear it down, and have walk-ups. Why can't we just walk up there and, uh, and have uh, same day, no appointment necessary, uh, testing done just like they're doing in Oakland? And Kip, I, I, I know I've had conversations with you and this is no, no, um, this is no, um, I, I don't want anyone to get defensive. I just want to find common ground and find a solution. This is not a time to, um, to defend uh, any barriers that we may have for people who really need potentially life-saving solutions. Would you like me to? Yeah, to yes, respond? please. Yes, thank yes, you. Sorry. <laughs> I, I didn't want to. No, I, I didn't want to cut <laughs> you off. Um, th thank you, Council Member. Uh, I, the points that you bring out around testing, tracing, and supported isolation are are exactly the questions of the moment. Uh, a couple of things that I would offer. Um, in in the spirit of collaboration and and working on this together, one is we have uh, have reached out to to Dr. Marty Finstersheib, who um, is incoming into this role for the county to 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 lead a more coordinated approach to testing, tracing, and supported isolation. And we've back in the day had a chance to work with um, Dr. Finstersheib with the Strong Neighbors Initiative work, which worked in many of these same neighborhoods that we know very well and we love. And so I think he's, he's somebody who understands the community, understands the public health issues. And so I, I'm very hopeful that he'll be um, the good partner now that he has been in the past. And so I'm hopeful on on that opening up some possibilities for for, for deeper partnership around the testing, tracing, and social isolation, uh, su supported isolation issues. To your point about both service delivery models and engagement and communication, I think those are, are really good ones. Uh, until you brought it to our attention, we had not realized uh, that there was a model out there that allowed people to do uh, walk, true, true walk-ups. And what we were learning is that that's a collaboration between Verily and a, a, a local nonprofit in Oakland, Roots, that is acting as an intermediary. And so we're, we're investigating right now and trying to understand and see what we can learn from it and what we might be able to apply to the east side. Because to your point, um, you can have the most beautiful sign up online function uh, in the world, but if you don't have access to the internet, if, you, if, you're, not, uh, if you're not digitally uh, comfortable and literate, that, that, that doesn't work for you. So we've got to make sure that we are, uh, uh, the testing is available to, to people across all channels. And so we're going to investigate that option uh, that, that, that is being deployed in, in Oakland, understand what we might need to do to apply it here and have that conversation with both the county and with Verily. And then similarly, we're, we're extending a, a request out to the county to engage in an engagement campaign, both a grassroots and, and a, a, a media push around helping people know what their testing options are for free, how to, how to get to them, what they need to do in a way that's clearer to them than it, than it is now. As, as I mentioned when I was responding to council member Esparza, it is a bit of a mosaic um, and you have to navigate through a lot of different pieces. The other thing that the county has let us know that they will be uh, working on is that the state is actually going to be doing some vetting of the types of tests. As you, as you know, there are a lot of different tests now out there on the market. The FDA kind of really loosened up on which ones could go out, and now they're. Uh, the state has realized that they need to do a little bit of a vetting to make sure people understand what they're getting and how reliable the tests are, and we think that will be helpful as well. But bottom line, um, until and unless we can do testing, tracing, and supported isolation well across the county, especially in the areas which we know are most vulnerable, uh, including the, the zip codes that uh, each of the council members has mentioned where, where we've had the disproportionate amount of deaths, we really can't come out of the shelter in place without putting a great number of people in jeopardy. So I, I, I agree and I, I will work as best I can as a partner to the county to support 
um, our engagement and and making that testing process easier and more transparent to the to the people who need it. Uh, my my only caveat is that that this is really where we have to we have to be good partners together, and and that's been challenging for us. But we are committed to working through that with the county. Uh, thank you for that. So the the this is what I want to say about testing. If we know if we know where the district the if we know the district or uh, or the communities that are being hit, that article was alarming only because it confirmed our worst fears, not because it was surprising, only because it confirmed what we already knew, and we were kind of hoping that it wouldn't be true. So, but if we know this already, I wanna emphasize this, if we know this already, this is what I fear, that if we don't control it, not only will the district where it is already being impacted be completely devastated and ravished by COVID-19, but I have news for you folks. It will not end with the borders of the east side. It will cross 101, it will cross 87, and it will cross 85, because guess what? They are traveling across those freeways to feed you to deliver to you and to work across those freeways because they have to. So it doesn't get contained on the east side. So we have to test folks uh, in a widespread manner in order to contain it, in order to isolate folks so that they can stay healthy and be able to uh, stave the contagion. Uh, this is uh, for the wealth and well-being of everybody. Right now, what we are seeing is just right now, we're able to somehow maintain it on the east side, but we know that this is a highly contagious disease and it knows no borders. So if I'm contagious and I don't know it, I'm asymptomatic, I will cross 85. I'm gonna pick up my sushi over at, uh, uh, in Almaden Valley. I have a favorite sushi place. I'm gonna, I'm gonna drive over there. That's where I'm gonna go pick it up. And my favorite Costco, guess what? on Almaden Expressway. So I just wanted to say that. So the last thing I wanna add is that I think also uh, as we're looking at, at, uh, at a, a very, a very you know, painful budget process over the next uh, several weeks, uh, I wanna make sure that we look at how we're going to um, preserve or support our, our cultural districts and you know those small businesses uh, and, and Pam Foley, uh, Council Member Foley brought it up how we're going to support our micro businesses. Uh, and I think the, the, the latest grant process is a wonderful start. But some of these micro businesses, they don't have extensive networks like some of the uh, other ones, uh, even the ones uh, downtown who I know are, are, are also struggling, but uh, they, they don't have a, a large uh, network. They don't have a large association that they can uh, call on. They don't have access to money. And so we have to also think of what, uh, what ways we're going to continue to support them, uh, what other uh, funding we can access, uh, what other kinds of trainings we can give them or how they we can help them, help them pivot and, um, and uh, you know, help them metamorphose into another type of butterfly. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know what the answer is. This is a very different world. And, uh, but I do know that we need to help them survive because they, they, they're not asking anything of us. They haven't asked for a job. They haven't asked for employment. They've made their own jobs. They've created their own jobs by providing services and products for us. And, um, and by also providing uh, quite potentially a, an employment opportunity for two or three other individuals who work in their establishments. And, and also they offer quite a, a rich, uh, uh, layer of um, character to our city when we look at Japantown or um, you know the the wonderful opportunities that our Vietnamese community offers the Latino community anyway so I just wanted to say um, that and, and with that I'll um, uh, thank you for 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 listening thank you uh, council member yep yes thank you mayor I just wanted to follow up a bit about the, the testing question that has been raised. I, I agree that we need to up our testing and we need to do more in that regard. But from 
what I've read, I'm a bit concerned because like Kip was mentioning earlier, it seems that the, the federal administration was very slow to act on swabs and, and testing kits and everything uh, during the initial wave of all this. But then they kind of just kind of, I don't know what they did, but they, they were very lax with the FDA and, uh, or sorry, with, uh, with the uh, antibody test. And so there's the RNA kind of no swab thing that is accurate in terms of uh, whether you have COVID. And now there are all these private companies just almost doing what they want with, with the testing on the antibody, te the serological testing. And my understanding is that that is not yet reliable. Uh, so to the extent that we are as a city promoting, you know, whether it's Verily or, or Carbon Health or any of these other private companies going out and saying we're doing free testing, if it's serological testing, I don't know if that data is dependable quite just yet uh, for lack of trials. So I don't know, it's kind of a difficult position to be in because we want to encourage people to get free testing, but at the same time, how much can we trust the results? Uh, yes, Council Member Diep, just I'll speak to that briefly. You, you know, part of, part of what the county is going to be playing a role in, and we are very supportive of them doing this, is at least for the ones that they're advertising and we're advertising, making sure that we're pointing people in the direction of a service that's useful. And so the, the, the kind of the gold standard is, is this uh, a PCR test that allows people to understand whether they currently have the virus active in them. And that's been the focus of most of the, of the testing uh, of one kind or another of, of, of testing of active infectiousness. When it comes to the antibody tests, the serology, as you're talking about, there is a great deal of unknowns about the level of both sensitivity, which is the percentage of the, the times the disease is detected by the test, and the specificity, which is the percentage of without the disease, which are ruled out. And so you, what you want is you want both a high sensitivity and a high specificity in these serology tests. And there just simply isn't enough data to, to be able to, to know where these tests are at the moment. And so part of, part of what I, I believe public health um, guidance has been to us is really at this point focusing on people on the tests which allow them to make clinical decisions. That is the tests which talk about the infect in infectiousness of the disease and whether it's present and focus on getting those people both the treatment that they might need and and uh, doing the tracing and isolation and that we should wait a little bit in some ways before we get too excited about the serology tests for two reasons one we want to make sure that they're accurate and there's still a little ways before we know about that and two because we do not know very much about the uh, nature of immunity to not overblow the fact that because I've had the COVID disease, I can go out and do X, Y, and Z. We don't know. So the public health guidance has really been to emphasize these tests, which focus on the infectivity, infectiousness, and to de-emphasize a little bit in terms of the public health strategy, the serology tests, until we both know more about how accurate they are, and we know more about the extent to which immunity is conveyed. Okay, thank you. I mean, a follow-up to that, I mentioned this a few meetings ago, and at the time we, we were unsure. I'm, I'm not, I'll raise the question again. My concern as we ramp up the testing is how we get the results processed. So one of the, you know, in, in the legal system, we have like, you know, rate kits that where people get tested, but then they just sit on a shelf and never get processed. So my concern is if we have a city of a million people or more, you know, we're offering free testing, we want that. And if if we offer frequent testing because we have to capture point in times, uh, where is all that going to get processed? What, what is the value of a test of a swab that never gets uh, examined? So what are we doing now to, to procure um, ways that, or laboratories, contracts, where they can guarantee us X amount of you know, results per week so we can actually provide results to, to our residents? Yeah, we, we on the city side are, are, are not taking an active role at this point in, in, in uh, in trying to procure that we have uh, and the mayor and others have been very strong advocates to the county to to like think through the whole supply chain right because it's 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 the swabs it's the it's the kits it's the testing sites it's the ability to process the the test it's the whole tip to tail supply chain which needs to be expanded and scaled and so uh, we've certainly offered to to help where we can but we we're really not in a leadership role on on those issues and so we've been um, encouraging and supportive of the county uh, to, that they take leadership to think about it tip to tail on that. At this point, um, we seem to have sufficient processing capacity to process the numbers of tests that we are 
uh, taking on a daily basis in the county. And so uh, to other points that are made, we kind of want to push and get pe drive people to those sites so that we begin to push against that capacity. At some point, we'll hit a bottleneck, but I'd rather have us hitting that bottleneck because we're doing too much testing, which at this point, we're not. So at this point, um, that's the constraint is not so much on labs ability to process. The constraint at this moment is us getting people to the testing sites and to fully utilize them as well as some continuing supply chain issues coming in. Sure. So to the extent that I, I mean, I'm not part of those conversations, but to the extent that, that we at the city city manager, uh, Kip, you are, please kind of push that thought process to the right officials for me. Um, my, my last question is, is unrelated to testing, but uh, a few weeks ago we were talking about helping residents, uh, putting them in contact with benefits. And I know the Silicon Valley Strong website has those resources. I, I was uh, curious if you know we're, we're actually doing case management or we have nonprofit partners uh, stepping up for that. But really, I, I've been doing something on my own time. And um, it, I've discovered that if you are a small business sole proprietor uh, eligible for the pandemic unemployment assistance program, but you just happen for like a month or so, had a part-time job with the W-2, under this, the program as it is, uh, all your, your 1099s don't count. So basically, if you basically have two years worth of 1099 income and you have a month with a W-2 income, the W-2 is what your benefits will be based on. And I think that's a, a flaw of the, the state program. And if Bena or anybody from our intergovernmental organization can just somehow lobby to get that fixed somehow, I, I think a lot of people are gonna be hurt because of that. Understood. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That's all. I'll yield. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Aranas. Thank you. Um, so I didn't take up my whole ten minutes earlier. No, so you didn't. <laughs> um, uh, as my colleagues were speaking about, um, uh, you know, the Latinos being overrepresented as well as African Americans that are overrepresented. Um, in uh, relative to the number of population that is, exist exists here in in San Jose, so my uh, my district has two of those uh, zip codes. I share them with Councilmember Esparza and Councilmember um, Carrasco, and so I'm I'm absolutely um, I I don't even know how to say it. I'm just really upset that we're talking about this once a hundred too many lives have been lost and we're finally talking about this and i know that i have said this from the very beginning that we know we know what our latino population here in san jose it's not news to any one of you who represents latinos we live in multiple families per house or per apartment and Knowing that, I think we should have had a strategy about how to prevent um, community uh, contact or, or contracting uh, COVID, knowing and understanding our Latino population. We understood the homeless population and how they congregate, and so we wanted to make sure that we uh, didn't have um, a lot of uh, contraction of the disease among our homeless population and so we move really quickly and i'm glad we did now i feel like we're um a little too late in this conversation as we're just talking about testing sites obviously there's testing sites in the east side because um you all knew that there was uh some over representation of latinos um impacted by COVID. so i want to know when did you all start realizing, even from your modeling forecasts or your conversations with the county that you have every single day, when did you realize that the impact on Latinos is what has been exposed now through Mercury News? Who's that question addressed to, Councilman Rennes? To whomever is courageous enough to answer. I'd be happy to respond uh, during my conversations with county leadership, uh, I don't recall a time in which that data was ever discussed prior to the time of the Mercury uh, article. Uh, I don't think there was ever a question in my mind that congregate housing, that is multiple families in, I shouldn't say congregate, I say multiple families under one roof would increase dramatically the risk 
of infection to people within those homes. And that's why I mentioned that very fact repeatedly when I pushed strongly for us to build more uh, prefab modular housing that would provide locations uh, for people to be able to stay, whether they are homeless or housed in a place where they can't possibly isolate. And I, I think I've been very public about that on several occasions in articulating the need for us to identify whether it's motel rooms or to build additional housing that can allow folks to isolate who cannot otherwise isolate. And how have we conveyed this opportunity to our communities? Because I don't know that my community knows that. I don't know that if any of my other council members who are impacted and have these zip codes highlighted in this article, and whether they're highlighted or not, all of us, every one of us, whether the, your zip code is mentioned or not, you have people who are overcrowded in your own districts and you have the responsibility to provide this, uh, at least this resource. Now, whether people take, you know, take us up on it is another thing, but I don't know that we've done um, a fair job in terms of offering this service to community. Uh, Amy from Housing, want to talk about how we're offering the housing? Or Dave? Um, <laughs> well, um, th there's a lot to these, you know, what the council member is asking. Um, you know, I think as far as, it, you know, I think the more data we have, the better informed decisions we will make. Um, so you asked a question about when we knew the information that was published in the Mercury News. Uh, for me, it was when I read the Mercury News. Um, the, the county dashboard has been providing, I think, valuable information and certainly information by race, but uh, there was certainly no way for us to get to the point of information that was shared in the Mercury News standpoint. But I think you know we are committed to having the information drive decision making. And so the more information we get, I think the better informed we are and we can, we can drive to the right decisions. So I'll, I'll just say that. Um, um, you know, in terms of you know, the, how we're um, trying to deploy our emergency housing, obviously, um, I think the council is pretty familiar with our, our strategies there in terms of trying to uh, put the housing anywhere we can find a place for it. That's basically the strategy. Anywhere we can find a place for it, we're trying to put it. Um, and so, and we welcome, uh, you know, any more uh, possible sites that, um, that we can find to, to place emergency housing. Yeah, I, I, we, and we can take this offline, but I just want, you know, I heard what uh, Council Member Carrasco was saying about this being contained to the east side. I would hate for us to look like policymakers and city administrators as it appeared to um, contain this to certain zip codes, um, because that I'm sure that is not uh, in anyone's intention. I, I know that is not what anybody intended. But that's what the result is. And so whether it's unintended consequence, I think now is the opportunity to really fix that um, and fix that with, um, and I'll support what uh, Council Member Carrasco said is through um, the services that now that we can offer. So the, through the testing, through the tracing, through offering um, services for those who are overcrowded in homes. So it, it really is now for me, I, I, I want to have this as a standing item that you all report on and that it's a standing item that you all ask the county and, and obtain that information, um, I don't know, on a weekly basis, however you see fit, but I wanna see this information back to us. I don't wanna to have to read it in an article and know that what we all suspected and we have been asking um, for and advocating for in the last weeks is actually coming true. So, Council Member, if I could just say, I don't think it would be humanly possible for us to ask for any more information than we've been asking for. It would be impossible. Yes. I can't say that any more firmly. Yeah. We have been pressing and working with the county on all fronts. Um, and, and I do believe uh, that the county has work, been working with us in sincerity 
but we could not be pressing any harder than we possibly than we are currently. And if I could just add to that, uh, you know, council member, what we know is what we know through the county, and what they put on their public dashboard is often what I rely on when I'm speaking to anyone. Uh, and for many weeks, they did not provide any geographic specificity about where cases were happening or where mortality was happening. Uh, and it wasn't until Thomas Fuller at the New York Times wrote a pretty scathing piece, they didn't release information about racial demographics of who was infected or who was dying. Uh, and it was some time after that. And I don't pretend to know what the causation was or, or what or how hard or easy it was for them to get that data. But to hold the city accountable or city administrators accountable for what is a public health responsibility of the county, all we can do, all anyone can do is convey what we're able to learn. And I think I'd have to reiterate what Davis said, because I ask a lot of questions every morning of, of county administrators that I do not get answers to. They are, I know they're running hard. I know that they have a lot to deal with in this pandemic. And so often for good reason, they can't provide that information. Uh, in some cases, I wish they were better suited to provide that information. But ultimately, if it's the county information, then the county needs to be held accountable. And to hold Dave or Kip accountable for the county is, is not appropriate. Okay, well, of course, uh, of course not. Um, but uh, some uh, reporter was able to piece all of this together. And so I'm thinking if they're able to piece this all together, we should be able to piece it all together and create some strategies to be, as policymakers, to be responsive to that. And so that's all I'm asking from here on. I'm not saying that we've done any less than what you, you could have done, or you're asking less information than what you can uh, humanly possibly ask, right? I'm, I'm uh, grateful for, for where we are now because we're certainly in a better place um, and I think Kip, you outlined that in your um, in your graphic uh, earlier. Um, but you know, I think what I knew from the very beginning was that uh, poor people, and that's probably poor Latino and people of color, African Americans, were going to be uh, hit the hardest. Anecdotally, I just knew that we all kind of know that, and um, and now it's being confirmed, and so now we do know. So now what we're going to do, what, what are we going to do about it? And I just don't mean testing, but I mean offering services that um, can change some of the future uh, and save lives um, uh, for all those folks in those zip codes that were um, uh, highlighted in the article. And, you know, and I've got to say that I'm really disappointed that only the folks who are Latinos on council are just... Um, up in arms about this and I don't hear any of my other council members and I would like to see um, some camaraderie here um, and be just as aghast as I am not because I'm a Latina and I'm of Mexican descent but because these are people that are dying in our city under our watch and that you would ask as many questions as possible to make sure that we had the solutions to prevent further deaths and so I'm going to um, continue to ask these questions as difficult as they are, as uncomfortable as they are, um, because this is the reason why we're serving, is to change policies and to make sure that we save lives, especially during these crises. I just encourage you to ask the questions of people who have the information. Uh, Great, and you know, we need to do it when we have that information. Thanks. Just a couple of small pieces of data, just confirmed with uh, Jackie, uh, who's been working in tight coordination with Key Lee over in the county, that um, as people are diagnosed, um, the county is providing housing placement and we're working with the county to make sure that anybody who's either homeless or who simply needs a place to isolate because they're in crowded conditions is being provided that um, either uh, hotels, motels, or space at, at the convention center. Um, and so that is one of the ongoing resources that is available and that is made available to people as they receive a diagnosis uh, with the county in the lead on that with the housing department supporting. Uh, Mr. Beekman. Oh, hi, I didn't, you ready to accept public comment? Uh, sure. Well, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, this is all uh, news to me, what uh, you're describing right now, and I'm kind of uh, aghast. Um, thank you. 
uh, you know, I guess for me, important things to learn at this time is how to just mellow out when I learn uh, information. And um, I don't know if this goes all the way up to uh, the, the federal Trump administration, the current administration. Uh, you know, I'm really saddened that uh, you're having trouble getting, uh, you know, statistical information that you need. And uh, I wanted to say a few words about um, uh, the vaccine process. I hope that uh, that is uh, moving forward. And I think just to my, a role that I can have at this time as the public is, is if I just part, be a part of how to mention the ideas of the vaccine process, um, you know, that there's the, the childhood issue that's developing with a, a strain of the coronavirus, um, you know, to make those publicly known, to have a place so that we can just, you know, pass along this information of what's happening. Uh, hopefully I can do that uh, uh, nicely and politely and, uh, you know, uh, so I hope the vaccine process uh, can really move forward in the next few months. And um, I don't know what else to say at this time, but uh, good luck to yourselves and um, good luck in your efforts and in, in, in monitoring how to go slow. And um, I think one more thing with 15 seconds is I'm learning the idea that this, this thing, even it can, form in pockets and there'll be small pockets of it and it can really all of a sudden blossom and flower out and, and be more infections again. So be very cautious on how we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Camus? No, oh, you put your hand down. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Carrasco, you were at, I think at 14 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. That's fine. I'll yield. All right. Thank you. I just had a few follow-up questions. Um, first, I think Councilmember Sparza hits on a really critical question, as I, as I mentioned. And uh, Kip, a, a couple issues. One is I know we all, county, city, everyone needs to do more to get information out to communities in, in a language, in a context that's uh, actionable and meaningful for the folks who are hearing the message. Uh, and is it possible we could ask uh, through the PIO that we have some social media uh, information provided in, in various languages that all the council members could actually, I know our own council staffs have capacity for translating, but just to be able to get the basic information out to um, our own communities in a direct way as possible. Um, I guess maybe that's more of a question for Dave. Uh, could we get that to all the council members so they can drive people to those testing sites as much as possible. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we could. I, I do want to have ask a question to Kip though, and, and or maybe even you know them here. You know, I think there was another piece of this though was um I, I do think there need to be modifications to the criteria. Yeah, the screening from the yeah, state. The screening criteria. So I think there's a couple of pieces to this, but yes. Yeah, that was my next question, which I, I know Kip has been in conversation with the head of the task force, the state level, a huge challenge we had. I know Verily sites and other sites with that state contract is they don't let everybody get tested if they're asymptomatic. And right. Kip, are, are, are you hearing there's any progress there? Yeah, I, I think I think that I think there's going to be some shifts on that as we're hopeful on it um, in terms of what a broadening of the criteria, exactly when that will take place and how that'll be communicated. I haven't heard a definitive, but we're hopeful that those criteria will be broadened and opened up soon. Okay, great. Yeah. Cause I know that is a huge challenge. Um, I I've been, um, you know, in terms of barriers to a lot of residents who need to get access on the Verily site, uh, it is, the, the appointments can be walk up or drive through, but only through the website and the Verily teams exploring uh, how to and handle walk ups and drive throughs who don't have appointments and to do that more effectively. They're required by virtue of the state contract to limit who can actually get tested. And so that is an issue between the state and them. And primarily we're trying to nudge the state to broaden those criteria. Last week, they did broaden the criteria somewhat to allow the definition of symptoms to include some additional symptoms that enable more folks to get tested. Obviously, we want to expand it to include 
more people who are asymptomatic beyond simply frontline workers and first responders because we know there's a lot of asymptomatic people who are exposed um, and we want them all to get tested. So uh, we're gonna continue to advocate at the state level uh, and I've certainly been pushing on the governor's team and I know Kip is pushing it as well and we hope to get some progress soon. I've also been pushing uh, with some of our private providers. Kaiser obviously is a key one in this region. And uh, through our conversations, they're now announcing they're going to ensure bus drivers um, who are asymptomatic and other asymptomatic frontline workers in uh, for the city, city, county, and VTA can get tested as well. So that will hopefully get more testing done. Uh, and then obviously we're gonna continue to push for when other companies and location. So um, certainly screening is part of it and certainly information is part of it. And we'll certainly push on our end, but in the meantime, it would be helpful if every council member would join in getting the information out by radio, by social media, uh, by TV, whichever way is in all ways that we possibly can. What I'm consistently hearing prior to last week was that we were not anywhere near capacity. Uh, those Verily sites, and I know that's true at other sites as well. Uh, on the other hand, we are told that if we can demonstrate that we can hit capacity in some of those sites, then we can get scaled capacity. That is, the capacity will come if we can show we're actually getting people to show up. So that's going to be really important for us as a strategy moving forward. Um, on the small business uh, grants, I just want to give a big thank you to uh, Mike Folks at Apple. Uh, for Apple's contribution and their whole team and uh, Michael Matthews at Facebook and Facebook's contribution as well um, that comprises the one and a half million dollars. And obviously we welcome more contributions for those who are interested in supporting it, the effort uh, through SiliconValleyStrong.org. Uh, our primary fundraising focus, however, is for, uh, for families who are struggling without paychecks. Um, Quick question about permits and inspections. Can, can we expect some update on that next week or do you guys have any numbers now? Yeah, thanks, Mayor. Um, we it didn't have any update for, for today, uh, but did want to loop back next week on uh, some of the, continuing some of the conversation that we had before. Obviously, um, information on, on the backlog and kind of where we're at with that, and also I think more generally, just how things are working out in the uh, development and construction world, so yeah. Okay, that'd be great, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and then I know we've also been in extensive conversation about contact, contact tracing with the county. Um, and I know there, we think there's a plan primarily to rely upon uh, public employees who may be furloughed, um, or otherwise uh, uh, not able to work. Uh, and I, I just wanted to know if we could come back uh, at a future date, if it is an opportunity to broaden the pool, particularly to be able to reach our unemployed uh, residents. Yeah, we, we can. Um, so we're doing a couple of things. We're, we're certainly evaluating um, their letter. Their, their letter had quite a bit of criteria that I think is not without its challenges, I'll just say that. Uh, so, and I know they're, they're trying to put together a, a pool of people that can stay committed to the work effort. Um, so they're, they're really looking for people that can commit to at least six months or a year or more to the effort. And, there, and there's other things in there. So I, I know they're, they're doing the right thing and trying to get the right team together, but absolutely, I, I think um, we wanna help, you know, link those opportunities to maybe others who are, not able to work um, and to, to, to you know, make, uh, get involved with this effort and, and perhaps maybe get paid for that. So um, that's, that's certainly something we can follow up on. Okay, great. Uh, and we all hope we can find a way to get reimbursement to be able to pay folks. That would be a great thing. Okay, uh, any last questions then before we move on? Okay, we'll move on then to item, um, to the consent calendar. Are there any items that anyone would like to pull from consent? I'd like to pull item 2.9. I don't see any hands. There's a member of the public who'd like to speak. Uh, Blair, welcome. Hi, uh, I need to fish out my uh, 
my my uh, my speeches. If you can, if you can uh, give me a second here. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, as uh, to speak to item two point eight, as the North San Jose marshland uh, may be uh, related to Measure B issues. Again, a thank you. As I feel that a few months ago there was a surprisingly good negotiations and dialogue between. San Jose and Good Green Sustainability Concepts of the BTA. Good luck and with overall equity ideas at this time as well. Item 2.11, to speak to street repavement of uh, item 2.11, I still hope city government is considering how it can be better expand uh, Measure T public oversight as it can offer such structured, well-organized, open community dialogue and public oversight this summer and for the next few years. Uh, with item 2.13, the money going to the public art projects for Berryessa Park and the Eastridge Transit app uh, station, uh, please try to spend this money responsibly and to what its purpose implies, as there was strange, not fully uh, sure, gossipy gossip that previous art funding was partially being awarded to install the Big Belly Smart Trash Compactors in downtown San Jose, and that have a very questionable secondary function as a surveillance and technology data hub. Uh, that, that is the big bellies. Uh, with 35 seconds left, uh, I also, I had a speech about item 2.5 on the approval of several council agendas from 2019 with technology items. It is interesting to note how good digital technology, digital inclusion planning, uh, both for pre and post COVID-19 can work best with a slow, cautious, steady approach and that responsible minimal use practices can accomplish just about as much as the current federal government drive in a massive expansion of 4G and 5G at this time. To conclude, I hope the community can really start to understand the health risks of broadband oversaturation of local neighborhoods and that responsible minimal use practices can accomplish much of the digital inclusion broadband needed at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councilor Davis, you want poll 2.12? Yes, thank you. Okay, so we're pulling uh, 2.9 and 2.12. Any other items? All right, is there a motion on the remainder? I move approval of the remainder. Second. All right, on that motion, are there any objections to those consent items being approved? Okay, I'm hearing no objection. So that motion passes. Uh, we'll move to 2.9, uh, and this relates to contract uh, for continued operation and compressed natural gas shuttle buses um, at the airport. And uh, I'm not sure if John's available. I, I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Oh, great. Thanks, John. Thanks for joining in. I appreciate your response to my text. Um, John, I, I appreciate that uh, you're in a challenge situation here because I guess the Proterra buses have got an issue with suspension and they can't get people out here to repair it. Is that right? Uh, that's that's correct. That's the first concern of our the most immediate concern, and then if when we grow, if we move uh, employees back to the west side lot, we will need additional buses. Um, so this is just a, a stopgap. We failed to qualify for the last round of FAA um, environmental funding. Uh, we were going to try and buy more uh, electric buses, and we didn't make the cut because we already had some. Um, but we're hoping again next year to do it. So this is kind of a gap fill until we can get the grant with the FAA, get additional electric buses, and, and have a, a path for our future. We felt uh, best to keep these. And we can get out of these buses in 30 days. So, you know, if we decide we need 10, then 8, then 6, then 2, we can step it down with just 30-day notice. So, so this authorization for $1.5 million is not... 1.5 out the door, it's uh, as needed. It would, the 1.5 would be if we kept all 10 for the year, which we don't think that we'll be doing that. We think we'll be scaling them back fairly quickly. Yeah. So John, I know that you're dealing with a really dire situation over there at the airport. Um, you know, we got data from BCG showing that 91% reduction in passenger counts uh, nationally. April year over year, I think 96% drop in, in revenues to airlines. Uh, we're seeing projections it's going to take the industry about five years to recover. And so, you know, when I saw this and it was sort of like planning for the rebound and I thought, well, it may be a little premature for us to be spending money on a rebound here. Um, if what we're likely to see is a 
pretty long winter there at the at the at the airport and i'm just wondering if there are cheaper alternatives given that we're just not going to see a lot of passengers there uh, for example, partnership with VTA or a, um, or a Lyft or others where we could be providing, you know, essentially the shuttle service at a much cheaper rate to a much smaller number of people who are going to need it. I assume it's primarily workers at this point. It's not really passengers. Yeah, it would be, it would be um, employees once we got to uh, uh, passenger counts that close the, you know, the opportunity for the employees to be on this side of the airport. Um, these buses are our existing fleet that we've had for seven years now. So they are fully amateurized, which is why the lease payment is significantly less than what I would, what I'm paying today, because <laughs> this is for like a June 1st thing. So what I'm paying today is significantly more because these buses are now fully amateurized and this lease payment is much lower. So I'm not sure that we'd be able to secure a really uh, flexible, more affordable option. But uh, what I can do is tell you that, you know, we wanted to get this in now so that on June 1st, I can work with our land side staff and say, do I need 10, 8, 6? What do I need? And then as soon as the Proterra buses get through their repairs, which if they start in July could happen over three to four months, we could get them all repaired. Then we'd be able to scale out of these faster. Um, I don't plan on keeping these for the year. I plan on yeah. keeping these until I have uh, confidence in the Proterra buses to take us through the gap, I guess. Right. And literally that depends on a mechanic in South Carolina getting on a plane to get out here, right? And spending a couple months with us to, you know, run through a, a suspension modification on each of the buses. Yes. Yeah. Because I... I I'm just looking at the cost elements at the end of the the memo, and it looks like we're we're paying 1.5 million, like in 2017, with a whole lot more traffic, obviously a lot more passengers than we are handling today. And I'm I'm just wondering why we're not getting a bigger discount <laughs> than paying them the, the standard rate for what is hardly anybody at the airport. Yeah, I guess what the uh, what the calculation is from what staff tells me is the price per bus. For the lease is cheaper the maintenance obviously because now it's a seven-year-old bus <laughs> goes up so it looks like it's almost comparable but if the buses aren't rolling we don't pay the maintenance part of it we would just pay the lease part of it um you know the, the maintenance is based on hours right so yeah. if the bus is sitting as spare you would only pay the lease portion i i'm you know i'm uh I'm, I'm comfortable reducing the number if, if that is, is what you would like to see. Um, I mean, I can, I have my staff next to me. I can suggest a number that's less than 10 if that gives you the comfort that I'm no, I, uh, I don't managing. Want, I don't want to tie your hands like that. I'm just more than anything asking questions because, you know, it's just puzzling to me that we are putting a lot of money into a service at the airport that, I mean, I think we know is serving you know, one tenth of the number of passengers it did. And, and so more than anything, I'm just trying to probe to understand all the explanation. And you're, you're, you're helping me understand a little better. I think the most important thing you really helped me understand is that we're not going to be necessarily spending 1.5 million. It's going to be some fraction of that. That's correct. Okay. Well, I guess, I guess that gives me some comfort. Um, because I, you know, for all the obvious reasons, I just hate the idea of spending a lot of money on, on something that, you know, I, I just think it's unlikely that that, you know, we're going to need to move that employee lot anytime soon, given what we know about, you know, even if this economy magically opened up and there, were, and I don't expect it's going to anytime soon. I think just the fear is going to be so palpable, particularly for you know any passenger over the age of 60. I'd be really surprised to see the airline industry rebound in any significant way for a long time. So anyway, I guess I sort of said my point. I, I, I look forward to, to seeing how we can um, you know, make sure that our, our, our run rate is, meets, meets the real demand. I, I know you'll be focused on that. Yeah, I, I understand your concerns, and we are – uh, extremely cost conscious out here. We'll, we will, I commit to you that we will manage this uh, to the right level of spending. Thanks, John.
Uh, is there a motion or another question on this item 2.9? Motion to approve. Second. Okay, motion council member Camus, uh, second by council member Davis. Uh, I, I, do I need uh, a roll call vote, Tony? I don't know if you need it. Do you want me to do it? I guess it's a consent item. So I'll just ask, are there yeah. any objections to this item passing? Okay, I'm hearing no objections. So that passes on the motion of council member Camus. Um, item 2.12, uh, council member Davis, you had some questions. I did, thank you. Um, so actually my question about the, it's the single use plastic bag regulations that were um, continuing a suspension. And I did wanna ask, and I don't know Dave um, who this question is for, but it's really about the um, grocery stores have also stopped taking the, the bags back. So they, they used to have kind of receptacles where they would take single use plastic bags and plastic film. Um, they're not doing that anymore, at least not the places that, um, I don't do the shopping in my family, but my husband does and he hasn't, we haven't been able to return them. So my question is about when, uh, when was that part of the suspension? Were they required to take them before and now they're not required to take them? How, when will that come back? Yeah, so I think I know there's staff on here that can kind of help with this. Yeah, so, you know, obviously, uh, this has happened in, in a couple of steps. First, starting with the health orders that uh, uh, prohibited using uh, the reusable bags, and but then people were still getting, uh, were still getting charged. And so this is in response to that, that suspends the, the fees associated with that. Um, I'm kind of seeing who's on the line here that maybe. So Dave, this is Jim. I, I think Casey Fitzgerald from Environmental <laughs> Services is on uh, the Zoom call. I don't know if Casey is on to answer questions for this. Casey, if you are. Thanks, Jim. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, Casey yes. Field, Acting Deputy Director, Watership Protection, Environmental Services. Um, as for the recycling of bags at the stores, that was not a part of our ordinance. Uh, so we would encourage residents to inquire with individual stores uh, with any questions they may have there. Okay, so in the, in the meantime, while this seems to be suspended at the stores, I wasn't aware that it was um, a voluntary service that the stores were, were um, offering, which is kind of interesting and great, but, um, is there anywhere that residents can safely dispose of single use plastic bags and plastic film? Like in my family, we save all the plastic bags and plastic film and we were, we were taking them to the grocery store because that's where they, that's the one place where they would recycle it. Certainly, um, I, I don't want to speak for our integrated waste management folks, but I do know that there are certain challenges with recycling those types of bags. Um, so uh, again, we would encourage residents to go ahead and, and inquire with the individual stores as to any of their recycling programs. Uh, they are not part of this temporary suspension or our ordinance itself. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll move approval of 2.12. Second. Second. All right, on that motion, uh, I don't see any members of the public who'd like to speak. Uh, are there any objections to that motion? I am hearing none, so that consent item will also pass unanimously. Okay, uh, we're done with consent. We'll go to the land use consent calendar though, 10.1. <clears throat> Let me uh, just pull those items off here so everyone's aware. Uh, there, there are four items under 10.1, although I believe one of them may have been deferred. That's correct, Mayor. We, we deferred item 10.1D. Okay. So the remaining items, uh, the street renaming, uh, conforming rezoning on Trinidad and conforming rezoning on Saratoga, are there on consent? Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Mayor? Mayor? From Council Member Foley, uh, second from Council Member Sparza, uh, Council Member Camus. Yes, I, I merely wanted to change one line in the in in uh, the one on Trinidad uh, for you know the the resolution. And, um, Why don't we pull that item off consent so you can do okay. that? Okay. All right. Thank you. 
All right, so we'll we'll pull that off. The motion will then apply to A and C. Uh, Councilmember Pros. Councilmember Pros, you might still be on mute. Thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, I just wanted to. Obviously, there was uh, a hope to do a little bit of uh, recognition and celebration around the renaming of Champions Drive to Wando Way uh, for Chris Wondolowski uh, with earthquakes and. Clearly, this whole season um, right now uh, may not even happen, but I uh, just wanted to say excited about this effort um, and this being able to move forward and look forward to being able to celebrate in that sometime in the future. Yeah, well said. Uh, Chris has been an incredible uh, champion for our community and, and certainly someone uh, we can all be very proud of, both for his accomplishments on the field and for being a good uh, role model off the field as well. So thank you. Okay. Uh, any other item, uh, any other discussion on the consent calendar? We'll just vote on A and C. Uh, is there any objection to items 10.1 A and 10.1 C passing? All right, I'm hearing no objection at this time, so that passes. Let's go to Council Member Camus on 10.1 B. I just wanted to me uh, merely just clean up a, a very small bit of language on condition number 50. Uh, from Public Works clearance in the very first paragraph, add the phrase to the satisfaction of the public uh, of the director of Public Works, and I'll put that on my motion. So everything is fine. Just wanted to make a very small uh, substitution for condition number fifty under Public Works clearance to add the word the phrase to the satisfaction of the director of Public Works, and I'll make that motion. Second. Thank you, Councilor Camus. Uh, that was condition number five zero. Mm -hmm. uh, for those of you who read condition 50 and have any concerns, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I appreciate it. It's in my district, so I. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I understand how it works. Council Member Esparza, did you have your hand up? No, Mayor. I accidentally raised it. Oh, okay. Great. Okay. Um, is there any objection to the passage of, of that item 10.1 B? Rezoning to Trinidad Drive. Okay. I'm hearing no objections. So we're going to move on then to item 3.4, which are actions related to the coronavirus relief fund. And we have a presentation on that item. Sorry. Let me uh, share my screen with everyone. All right, Mayor, can you see the screen correct? Uh, yes. Thank you. All right, um, so uh, Lee Wilcox, Chief of Staff for the City Manager's Office, and I'll be handling the presentation today on, on behalf of myself and Jim Shannon. Want to thank uh, probably too many people individually to thank that, that uh, worked on this action um, kind of retroactively and putting this together um, throughout the week and over the weekend, but really want to just uh, quickly, a big shout out to the finance department, the city attorney's office, budget office, and our recovery and finance sections in the uh, uh, emergency operations center. It was a big lift to get here and, and very much appreciate their work and, and what it took to get here. Um, as you saw in the last last presentation in 3.1, our, our three approaches to financial recovery, do it right, maximize our reimbursement and minimize the general fund impact. The actions outlined in this memo um, operationalize this guidance um, in the naming or in the name of supporting our community. We will walk through that. Um, you know, we've really taken the strategy that we've put in place several weeks ago, which now other cities are starting to follow in our waterfall effect. Um, this is our strategy for the response, and you will see um, throughout the memorandum. Um, you know, have we been careful to separate what will be FEMA reimbursable and what will be subject to the coronavirus relief fund. Um, we are operationalizing this strategy throughout the memo by first looking at the use of our FEMA funds through the reimbursement process and then the coronavirus relief funds. Um, and there's discussion throughout the memorandum on that strategy. Today, uh, this memo uh, proposes uh, quite a few recommendations, all of which can really be uh, categorized into three main buckets. First, 
uh, establishing a coronavirus relief fund to ensure that we separately account for eligible activities. We need to be very careful about how we are spending these funds on eligible activities. Otherwise, we could end up, as we discussed in the last section, being in a position towards the end of the year where there's a clawback on some of these funds of the federal government. Second, we are providing budget support to continued uh, emergency operations, including providing temporary shelter and supportive services to our homeless individuals and ensuring uh, continuity of essential services throughout the city. And lastly, providing residents with food and other necessities as appropriate. And then lastly, um, all of the agreements in here are enabling to allow us to feed, shelter, and provide these necessities to our most vulnerable populations. Uh, the, appropriate the, uh, the appropriation actions um, in the memo support three of our key goals that are critical um, items to our roadmap. And these are our temporary shelters um, and the related support services needed for these. It is the purchase of PP&E equipment to continue to provide continuity of essential services by protecting our workforce to do this. And then lastly, the, the, the program uh, around management and food around our food distribution program. We're gonna, um, there's obviously a lot of different um, actions in here, mostly supporting, as I just mentioned, our shelter program, our PP&E and the food distribution program. Since a great majority of the agreements focus in around our nonprofit partners and our private sector partners around food distribution program, I'll just take a second to remind everyone where we are. Um, as our community was hit um, by the, economics effect, uh, the economic effects caused by the public health measures to slow and reduce the spread of COVID-19. The team has been able to sprint and provide food and necessities for our most vulnerable uh, throughout the county. Through the current distribution framework, upwards of 500 meals are distributed daily throughout the community by our community-based organizations, our schools, city of San Jose contracts, um, and with meals being provided to different participants, such as, our, such as the medically vulnerable seniors, low-income children, families forced into poverty due to the impacts of the shelter in place and associated economic downturn and our unhoused populations. As a participant in the meal distribution uh, framework and program, the city has either secured or is in the process of securing uh, capacities provide additional 150 meals um, a day. The total capacity will be achieved through three different agreements as followed, up to uh, 20,000 meals per day um, with San Jose, San, Jose Union, uh, San Jose Unified School District, 30,000 meals per day, which is the first agreement with Revolution Foods, and then lastly, the large agreement and the second agreement with Revolution Foods to provide up another 100,000 meals per day based off of our calculations of possible peak demand. In addition to the capacity for these 150 meals per day to the general public, the city um, is doing agreements with Team San Jose, World Kitchen, and the Health Trust to provide meals to targeted populations Lastly, we are proud of the work that has been, been done this far with the team. Um, and I wanna thank Angel Dolan and his team for their leadership on this. Also outlined in the memo, um, and what we started to walk, walk through is our analysis um, and, and working with our federal consultants on what will be reimbursable and then we're continuing to work through the Treasury Department on the Coronavirus Relief um, Fund. So these efforts are complicated. Um, from a funding perspective, there are three challenges that we see that um, we are charting a strategy to address in this memorandum and then also in the analysis for the source and use. First is FEMA will not reimburse for meals provided to those outside the city of San Jose, including those in unincorporated areas of, the, of Santa Clara County or other cities. Second, um, it is possible that we cannot use the coronavirus relief funds outside of the city of San Jose. To address both of these problems, we are actively pursuing reimbursement agreements 
with the other jurisdiction, include other jurisdictions, including the County of Santa Clara, and we will be, begin discussions with the other cities throughout the county as well. The third challenge is FEMA, as noted last week uh, on May 3rd, uh, did inform us that we will only be reimbursed for meals provided to those directly impacted by COVID-19. Residents that have been diagnosed as being uh, positive for uh, COVID-19, residents that are high risk, such as 65 or older with underlying conditions, or residents that are unable to leave home because of COVID-19 exposure. As you know, the effects of COVID-19 go far beyond these populations, however. Uh, a great number of our residents that have been economically impacted um, by the necessary shelter in place still need to be fed. And so for that, we are proposing to backfill the loss in what we would see in FEMA reimbursement with the coronavirus relief funds. This memo lays out the strategy to answer both of these issues while still meeting the responsibility of our community. Uh, th this table provides detail on the contracts that you will be um, uh, approving, uh, negotiate and execute as part of the recommendation. Of note, we propose using the emergency fund, uh, the emergency reserve funds for those contracts that we believe we still will be FEMA reimbursed for in total. So as you can see on this slide, the Team San Jose Agreement, um, World Kitchen, uh, World Central Kitchen, as well as the Health Trust, we'll be funding those out of the emergency reserve because we believe those will be FEMA reimbursed. And again, the emergency reserve fund is a general fund source. So we'll be able to backfill that. Other funds, we are going to keep in the coronavirus relief fund until other, um, until we see clarity on that. Lastly, so that round, rounds out the appropriation actions taken by um, the appropriation recommendations by staff, again, the appropriation actions will support the temporary shelter program and the operational expenses that we continue to occur, the PP&E for our workforce, continuing to provide essential services and the overall food distribution program, looking backwards as well as how we forecast it out. With that, we are available uh, for any questions you may have and uh, Jim Orpal and Angel Rio are also available for questions on food distribution or the homeless program. Thank you, Mayor. Great, thanks, Lee. And I appreciate you jumping in. I know Jim is currently uh, wrestling in budgetary hell, and <laughs> we hope he'll emerge at some point in the purgatory uh, sometime soon when, uh, when uh, all that uh, challenge with the budget is worked out this week. Uh, okay, any questions? Council Member uh, Jimenez? Thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, Lee, I had a question. The, the number that stood out to me was that uh, number associated with Revolution Foods. I think it was $22 million, which is a uh, boatload of money. <laughs> um, I also obviously know that that's feeding a lot of folks. The question I have is this, is that, uh, is there any commitment from Revolution Foods to, to hire some of the folks necessary to do that work from our community, given that they're from Oakland? Uh, and I'm not, and I'm not sure if that's something within the sort of bounds of, of the negotiations that took place and such, or if that was something that came to mind. But that comes to mind for me as I look at this, and I'm curious about that. Yeah, I was uh, looking if Angel was on the line. It doesn't look like he, oh, yeah. no, I'm sorry, he is. Yeah, Angel led those negotiations. I think he could better update than I could on that. Yeah, yeah, Council Member Jimenez, the, the Revolution Foods contract, uh, so there's two, right? There's the 1.9 million, which was that first initial contract that we rolled out to just have that immediate response. That was primarily with school districts to, to really fill in gaps for, uh, as they stood up their sites. Um, and, and that worked really well. Um, the second one that has the up to $22 million, and, and, I, and, and, and I'm glad you asked the question because what we're doing with that contract is buying capacity up through that amount of money. You know, we're hoping that we're not going to have to get to the point uh, in this crisis response to expend and draw down up to the $22 million. But in the event that we had to say this thing got worse, uh, and, and just uh, there was an a, a exponential need for uh, food distribution that would secure our availability capacity to meet that need. And so it's, it's, it's more of a, a, a safety measure more than anything. In terms of your second question, um, I, I can't speak specifically around whether or not San Jose residents are being employed by Revolution Foods, although I'll, I'll inquire on that. But I do know 
that the other uh, byproduct of this whole food, food distribution system is that whether it's through nonprofits, whether it's through the restaurants that are cooking some of these meals, or whether it's through deliverers, uh, th there's an economic recovery aspect to this as well because th th these are uh, these are uh, restaurants and locations that are actually hiring people to do this work. And of course, that's complemented significantly with volunteers as well, right? But so there is that economic recovery uh, piece to it. We'll drill down a little bit more and perhaps report out, out on that uh, at a future date. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I think um, it, it just makes sense, right? If we're, if we're and, and I know this is countywide, so it's not only San Jose, but uh, I think it'd be great to, to have that conversation to the extent we can actually, as you said, the, the economic benefits are going to emanate from this contract. I think to the extent we can wrap in, in a more systematic way, some of the very folks that are impacted by this that are maybe sitting at home, uh, you know, get them back to work. I think it'd be helpful, you know, to do that to the extent possible. But uh, uh, I thank you so much for, for the negotiation. I know this is a, a, lot, a lot of work and uh, I very much appreciate the efforts. Uh, Councilmember Esparza. Thank you. Um, I um, wanted to um, talk a little bit about um, the food actually on the, um, on the contract that was just raised in terms of our capacity to expand in areas of need. Can you talk a little bit more about that, please? Yeah, um, so, so for example, um, in fact, the, you know, the, the previous conversation around the, the, the zip codes where we're seeing um, you know, you know, higher levels of, of, uh, of corona infection. Um, you know, for, for our food distribution strategy, those zip code areas are really ground zero. You know, we, we and now of course we had the vantage point that we already understood as a city uh, the, the poverty uh, within those within those uh, zip codes, right? So, although the, the work of our food distribution strategy isn't limited to those four zip codes, those four zip codes really became ground zero for the work that we did in terms of you know responding to food uh, the, the the food crisis, which as we know food is a, a significant pillar to good health, right? Um, and so um, the the Revolution Foods contract, for example, what, what's very what's very cool about it is that we're able to buy capacity and really tap into economies of scale. When you take a look at the per meal price that we negotiated, we are paying two dollars and seventy five cents per meal. That's even below market rate. During a typical market, you're basically within a four fifty to six fifty per meal price because we've been able to. Uh, uh, tap into and negotiate from a perspective of economies of scale and up to volume language and doing that in partnership with our school districts, um, that, that we were able to really drive that price down and, and to, and more importantly, secure that capacity to, to feed our community uh, during this time of need. But the, the, the main infrastructure to get, this, uh, get, get these meals served is really through our 32 school districts countywide. And so, for example, uh, you know, one of the things that our schools have done really well is they've stepped up and using USDA funds, they're able to provide their, their, the typical meals that they would normally provide. The gap that we're seeing is in weekend meals. So Revolution Foods, this contract is going to enable us to come right behind that, you know, the five days that the school covers and basically cap the other two days over the weekend. And we started a pilot uh, about three or four weeks ago with Eastside Union High School District and Franklin McKinley School District. We, we targeted Andrew Hill, Overfelt High School, Silver Creek, and there's one other, James Lick, uh, as a pilot to, to really test need. And we're actually expanding that. This week, we're adding uh, ev uh, six sites at through the Evergreen uh, School District. We're, we're activating all seven sites within Elmrock School District. Uh, there's, uh, there's, we have 33 sites total in San Jose Unified School District, and that includes sites such as Olander, uh, 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 Washington Elementary, um, Lowell, uh, it, sites that where we know there's families that have significant need. And so what we're able to do is really piece together a partnership with the schools, uh, provide using the Revolution Foods contract some wraparound uh, services to then augment the need that is there and really maximize the impact on community at the lowest cost possible. And I think that's uh, not only good use of public funds, but more importantly, really meeting the need where it is. Thank you for that. And um, I just 
would like to remind my colleagues that in the Franklin McKinley School District, which includes the 95122 zip code, um, they did experiment with handing out um, meals on a weekly basis, but that just didn't work because families are living in such overcrowded living conditions that they couldn't, they had no way to store five days worth of meals for everyone in the family. And so having a meal program like this that is accessible um, on the weekends as well as weekdays is huge for um, communities like in District 7. Um, and so thank you for that. I also had a question um, around the food bank. So um, I know that they uh, pursue donations, but they do also buy food. And I'm wondering why they're not um, on here because we're so reliant on them or is that just sort of a separate issue? Actually, it's just a separate strategy. Uh, the okay. food bank is probably our foremost partner. Uh, we have over, we have 400, you know, 422 distribution sites, but who's counting? Um, 300 of them, 305 of them are, are operated directly by Second Harvest Food Bank. And what, what has been great is that the community has really stepped up philanthropically uh, around donations. So from a, from, a, uh, from a receiving food and receiving donations to really strengthen the Second Harvest Food Bank, that, that has gone very well. We as a as an EOC have also and as a city have also uh, helped them uh, uh, acquire access to the National Guard, uh, uh, forklift drivers, uh, you know, personnel, volunteers, uh, and then that's part of that strategy. Our biggest site, for example, uh, one of our biggest sites is the site over on Kurtner over at the Cathedral of Faith site, right? And that site literally has quadrupled in size and we, in fact it got so big that we literally had to in coordination with San Jose PD and DOT engineers had to kind of rework the traffic flow because we had cars backing up to 87. Um, so uh, I, I didn't mention Second Harvest Food Bank in that example because the Revolution Foods contract is, has more to do with the partnership that we have with the school districts meeting very specific uh, communities. The Second Harvest Food Bank, Bank distribution sites is really the cornerstone of our whole strategy. They are pr probably our premier partner uh, as we do this work. Thank you. And I brought that up because I do understand that they're the cornerstone in the Cathedral of Faith uh, example. Um, they fed 77,000 people in April alone. Um, and so, uh, which is just mind boggling one. Um, and I was out there, went very smoothly, thanks to the support from DOT, SJPD and many others. Um, but, um, and I also, I was impressed by um, what a position of trust that they held in the community because there were a lot of folks that um, I talked to that went there and they felt comfortable going there um, when maybe they had some fear and going to, you know, because of the national, what's going on nationally, it does impact our own neighborhoods here in San Jose. And um, there was a tremendous amount of fear. And um, I was talking to the director of their food assistance program and um, the mother that would come and volunteer um, and then take food back home uh, was sick and wasn't coming. So he delivered food to them and they had nothing in the refrigerator for her or her children. And that was just kind of the normal thing. And there are a lot of families that are, you know, after two months are living like this um, with no other food than the food that they get um, through these efforts. Um, from not just the city and the food bank, um, but from so many groups across our city that are all pitching in and doing their best. And um, so I wanted to acknowledge that and thank our city um, staff and all the partners in the community because I think um, everyone has really come together to serve the folks, to serve our neighbors. And that's been the North Star throughout all these efforts. And as this goes through uh, December, um, I, we can expect that um, you know, people might flag a little bit. And so telling the story of the impact that people are making, to me, is really important. 
Um, I had a question about our exit plan um, as it relates to food with that, that this goes through December 31st and at some point um, we need to have a plan for what happens next. We don't want, we want to ensure that people are being served, but we don't want to, we don't want people like the families I just described to fall through the cracks. So what is our plan for handing this off at some point? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's, uh, that, that's a question that's top of mind for us. Uh, you, you know, the, the first order of business, as you all know, for us was first and foremost, making sure we, 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 we as a city, are, are meeting the immediate need within our community and of course, countywide also as, as, uh, as, as we've done this kind of, you know, with a countywide focus. Um, we, we've been, uh, as, we, as we've been doing this work, you know, the, the County of Santa Clara is one of our key partners, right? We have s several of their directors that work on our, on our teams. We have, uh, we're working with agent services. And one of the things that we are doing is we, we are documenting a lot of the way we've done this work. And we feel that, that at, at, at the right time, we're going to be able to kind of hand off a pretty coordinated system back over to the county. And that is the expectation that we would turn this back over to the county at some point. Um, we, we do need to, to really true up the exit strategy and also when, uh, you know, up, up until the date, uh, right now we're, we're tentatively talking through December 31st. Uh, between now and then, we also have to continue to, you know, monitor the, the fiscal impact of that work, uh, as well as doing a staff analysis, especially as we move to stages six, seven, and eight, where we, we begin to reopen City Hall and ramp up our own city operations. Uh, many of our food distribution uh, staff are, have been redeployed, and so we need to, you know, make sure that we transition that properly in our, in our in, within our EOC and under Lee and Kip and others uh, and, and working closely with Dave uh, we're, we're, we're thinking through all that um, and, uh, and and so our goal is that over the next few weeks we actually you know finalize uh, a, a good uh, transition plan uh, I will tell you this that you know last week uh, you know, I presented on food and the dashboard that was updated just a week later uh, the weekly meals increased by another 73,000, right? And, and if you recall the numbers last, last week, um, you know, the, the number I reported was 150,000 meal increase per week, you know, on top of the previous week. And so, so right now, the latest dashboard number, just to kind of keep everyone, everyone updated, uh, our daily meals served uh, through last week, uh, daily 524,000. 766. Our weekly meals were at 2,628,550. Uh, so, so we're still seeing the, the, the need increase. The good news is that it's not increasing as drastically as it has been the first few weeks. So we're hoping that that continues to, to trend in the right direction. But uh, back on the exit strategy. We, yeah, could I, yeah, could I just jump in, Angel? Thank you for that. I think, um, you know, the true up that, that Angel mentioned and, and really the reconciliation that Lee mentioned in the presentation, you know, I, I think, um, you know, we, we certainly jumped on this issue, but it is time to, to do that true up. It is time to do that reconciliation. Uh, next week, um, we are trying very hard to bring to the council uh, the interagency agreement with the county that really authorizes us to do this work on behalf of the county. Um, I mean, that's kind of how far behind we are. <laughs> um, but, you know, I'm I'm feeling somewhat, uh, you know, uh, like we're, we've, we, we, we really need to tr do this true up and reconciliation. Um, and so, um, you know, I had personal conversations with Jeff Smith. We're really trying to get that on our agenda for next week and, and on the board agenda for next week so that, you know, we make sure that um, that process can really begin. Um, so more to come on that. Okay. Thank you. That's it. Thank you. And really appreciate your work in trying to get the agreement to come forward. I mean, the amazing work is being done on the ground, but uh, not only is FEMA telling us they're not going to reimburse most of those meals, uh, which are serving, you know, families who don't have paychecks, uh, as opposed to people who are actually infected. But, but I understand with CARES Act funding, we can't fund any of the meals beyond our, our, our city limits. And so that agreement is going to be so important. Uh, Councilmember Rennes? Uh, great, thank you. Um, so I have a question, um, I guess, just to build on that point that you're making there about, 
your concern uh, in not being able to um, get covered or reimbursed for some of the work that we're doing outside of the city of San Jose. I know the, the World Central Kitchen, which is um, under the FEMA covered um, items, it, it, it continues to be a, a countywide service. Um, so, uh, and I know that in the memo, it said that you are all working towards uh, reaching out to some of the cities, having those conversations now. Do we feel pretty confident that, that we will get some money from those cities so that we can continue to do this? Yeah, yeah we actually do feel confident. Um, if, if the collaborative nature of our work to date is an indication of it, then I would say yes, because we, we do hold a standing uh, city-wide coordination meeting on a weekly basis. And from day one, we were kind of all in this together uh, and, and doing all the heavy lifting together and in partnership with the cities. Our original intent based on the first FEMA guidelines that were that were released was that we would be that lead agency and then we would turn around and then you know kind of just build people on the back end with 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 the more recent uh, definitions that have come out it seems like that strategy isn't really acceptable to FEMA so what we're doing is we're kind of going back to square one back to the cities and we'll just need to work out an individual agreement with each respective city uh, that that is uh, participating in this effort but but I got to tell you we've been doing this together in coordination with cities this has not just been the city of San Jose we've been working with, uh, with just about every key city in this in this county so I'm hoping that uh, that'll facilitate this transaction Thank you. I, I know that it was, you know, kind of a bit of bad news um, that we couldn't get some of this covered, but I know that you're working around it. I can appre I appreciate that. I, I also wanted to make sure that, um, you know, I have a question about the World Central Kitchen because I want to make sure that, that we're getting the best prices. I know that you do too. Is this, uh, and this is uh, using some of the restaurants, is it local restaurants in San Jose or is it based in the other cities that we're working with as well in the county? Yes, yeah, so, so World Central Kitchens is a partner that we recruited to work with us specifically around the Great Plates uh, effort and that and the Great Plates effort, as you recall, is the initiative that the governor's office announced uh, along with, with FEMA aimed at serving uh, vulnerable seniors and at the same time trying to reopen restaurants that had been closed. And I know the, the mayor had been actively involved with this initiative as well. And by the way, there's only, since the announcement, there's only six cities that have actually uh, launched a program and uh, we are one of those cities. Um, and right now we're, we're going through a soft launch. That's why you haven't heard a whole lot of hoopla. We're just, we're making sure it works right. But World Central Kitchens is the organization. It's a nonprofit organization that we identified to manage the restaurant partnerships because this is what they, this is what they do. They have the capacity to do that. Um, and the, the restaurants that we've identified are all local restaurants. So for example, the restaurants in our initial pilot are all San Jose based restaurants. Uh, when you take a look at the list, uh, you'll see that it, it's a diverse list, everything from, from Mexican food to Asian American food, to just a, a good good diversity. Um, and when you take a look at the pricing, if you're referring to the price, um, the, the $22 per, per, per meal cost is, it, when you compare that to say a Revolution Foods, this is apples and oranges. The $22 cost, that means it's everything, everything from cooking the food, distributing it, uh, the, the administration of the restaurant. It, it's like literally A, a to Z bottom line outdoor price. And, and what's also unique about that effort is that the majority of those funds have been pre-approved already in terms of reimbursement. You know, we got 75% reimbursement through FEMA, 75% of the 25% gap, and then only 6.25 would be the, uh, the, the gap in funding that cities would have to absorb. Um, so uh, that, that's, that's the Great Plates uh, effort. We, we've launched it, a soft launch. Uh, we, we're two days so, into it. Yeah. And I'm so sorry to interrupt you. You said 75% of that's coming from Z, uh, FEMA, and then the other 25% is coming from, I apologize, I didn't get it. Yeah, the other 75 is actually, it, it, so 75% so is coming from FEMA, and then 75% of the remaining 25% is uh, coming from the state of California. And then that leaves a gap of about 6.25%, if my math is correct. And uh, that's the only unfunded gap that we would need to, to pick up. 
Um, uh, we're targeting, uh, you know, this will be a countywide effort. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Where, how would we pick up that 6.25 that's left unfunded? Where would that come from? That would need to be picked up either through the the one of the funds, uh, either the Corona Fund, the General <laughs> Fund, or kind of one of those waterfall. Um, so we uh, be, because that is so the uh, what Angel's referring to is there, if for for most FEMA reimbursements, there's a six and a half percent local match that needs to happen. So um, as you can see, world because we are expecting FEMA reimbursement for upfront costs that we're associating with this agreement. That's why this on page nine of the memo, you can see that the, the world, Kitch, uh, world Central Kitchen is funded in the emergency, um, the emergency reserve fund because we are expecting FEMA reimbursement. Uh, yes, and I, I heard that there's a, a percentage that is not going to be funded uh, either through FEMA or CARES um, and that's the match that you're referring to now. Yeah, yeah that's, that's, that, that's that 6.25. But the trade-off here, when you look at it, is you have your most vulnerable being uh, uh, getting access to food. Uh, and, and by the way, source-wise, the county uh, agent services, uh, AAA, is the, is the organization that is pre-identifying and screening uh, uh, our, our seniors. And it's a very tough clientele to get to because uh, these are seniors that that cannot be served by through any other means. So this is a very unique population. It's one of the most uh, vulnerable uh, of, of the entire community. And already we have upwards of 400 people screened and ready to go for the Great Plates program. So we're, we're really off and running. Uh, and with this, through this initiative, it's really gonna not only serve a, a very uh, tough population, at the same time, it's gonna actually uh, hopefully reopen some restaurants, uh, you know, yeah, no, that would be wonderful. I know that we have a a um, a population in our area, um, a large. Well, of course, everyone has um, their seniors in their own respective areas, but we have them in areas that overlay with poverty and are in those zip codes that we've been talking about. And so, if there were um, additional uh, seniors that we wanted to refer, um, that we know that are homebound. Um, how can we refer those into your system? Yeah, uh, w w right now they can contact SourceWise source -wise directly, but uh, within the next day or two, we're gonna be doing a mass uh, kind of media distribution with contact points and, and a, a lot of information. Right now the soft launch has been very low key because we just wanna make sure that by the time we launch it, we're doing things right and, and that it's all working because the last thing we wanna do is frustrate you know, participants that are trying to access this service. Uh, so it, 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 you will receive uh, very detailed information very shortly. Okay, thank you. So, so um, I, I know that a lot of, we've talked about like some of our micro, um, uh, businesses, especially our very small businesses that um, serve uh, ethnic, you know, friendly food. Um, I have a large Vietnamese community, of course, a large Latino community in those zip codes. Along Tully, you'll find uh, an array of Vietnamese, very good and very good uh, Mexican restaurants. I'm making myself, working myself up to uh, be hungry again. Um, how can we, how can we feed and, oh, pun, uh, how can I ensure to wrap up some of these restaurants or give them an opportunity to be part of this process so that they can have some viable ways to stay open? They might be really small and not as sophisticated as some of the larger chains. So uh, I don't know if the, the deal is done and there's no more uh, acceptance of future restaurants, but if there is, how can we do that? Or we, we can, we can talk offline if you like, if it's, it's more um, involved. Yeah. Yeah. That, that will be part of the information that we'll be sending out. There is a website where restaurants can go in and actually, uh, you know, sign up. I do want to manage some expectations because this is a pretty small scale program. And uh, so it's, it's really at the end of the day, only going to be really a handful of, of restaurants in totality. 
Um, so I do want to manage expectations that way. But nonetheless, we'll be uh, uh, sending out uh, very specific information, both if, if you're a participant, if you uh, want to refer somebody, or if you're a restaurant, uh, we'll, we'll make sure that we make that crystal clear for everyone in very short order here. Thank you. I mean, I think we're all trying to preserve our own uh, re uh, restaurants and businesses in our districts. I know uh, for this week, we're actually, our district date is, has uh, D8 Eats, and so we're promoting uh, different kinds of restaurants on different days. Yesterday, it was Meatless Monday, and so we had a lot of uh, vegetarian options, uh, but I'd love for all of you to, to be part of that, as well as our District 8 residents. But that was just um, a promo there for my own district. Um, and, and, you know, ultimately we all want our restaurants to thrive. And so I will keep that in mind that it's, it's limited, but hopefully we can, we can have some of those folks be part of that. Um, so you said um, the cost per meal for those are, are, is pretty high compared to the rest of them. Cause that was one of my questions. And I read through the whole memo and it was, I had to like, piece it all together because in one section it had the description of the restaurants and the other section it had description of the service and then the other one had this description of the actual cost and so I had to put it all together and and none of them have a standard cost per meal estimate um, a real one except um, did I ever work one out I, I'd like to see more of a, a breakdown on the cost per meal estimates for each of those uh, uh, programs as well as it can happen. And the reason I um, I mentioned is, is this, and I don't know if you probably already did this, of course, is that you compared the cost that it would um, take, let's see, Revolution Foods to uh, provide a meal versus our own district and what they would pr be able to provide had we, you know, instead of so I'll take Evergreen, for example, Evergreen School District, even though it has some really great uh, schools in there, there, also there's some really good schools that have a lot of needs that are Title I's. And so those are the, uh, those are all, again, those are the zip codes that we're, we are very concerned about and want to provide a lot of support to. I don't know if they can, if they were offered an opportunity to provide meals on the weekends, or is Revolution Foods going to provide all of those gaps that you found in terms of when people, when the school districts are offering food and when they're not. And I think primarily you said it was weekends. So were they given an opportunity to, to, uh, to maybe provide this service rather than revolutions coming in and doing the service for them? I, 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 I do wanna make it real clear that Revolu Revolution Foods is not the only provider they, they are probably the um, our biggest stopgap measure you know uh, if, if you will right uh, um, we, we have different strategies so everything ranging from for example revolution foods as we partner with school districts but also team san jose uh, who they have a, a per meal cost of about four dollars per meal and they have been our, our, our huge partner as we as we reach out to the in-house populations that we have at parkside south hall uh, you, you know, all our, our sheltered sites, motels, hotels. Uh, and, then we, and then we also have uh, uh, groups like Hunger at Home who come in at $5 uh, a meal. And it, with each one of those, there's kind of two filters that, that, that we've used. Uh, one of them is the, the FEMA filter. And the, the FEMA filter says that you got to pay a reasonable price based on market rate. So that's kind of one of our driving filters. The other one is is we take into, uh, we, we, you know, we just practice good fiscal negotiation and management. And, and, and you know, I, and for me personally, I'm a stickler when it comes to that because, I, you know, we, we kind of were managing these negotiations and the way we're managing the funds that are trusted under our management as if they are our own. And we're, so we're trying to tap into economies of scale. We're trying to make sure that we're getting the best price possible for the city. Uh, and the best quality too, right? It's not just, you know, just the lowest price, but also quality, you know, healthy ingredients and so forth. And I think the combination of those two filters have proven pretty effective in the work that we've done. And I'm going to be very honest, uh, there's a lot of people that we've also frustrated because there's some organizations that we have straight up said, we are not going to do business with you. And they're saying, hey, but we're right here in San Jose. And, and, and it's almost like they feel like we should be doing business with them. If they can't meet the quality and the quantity and the pricing, you know, expectations that we have and doing it in a timely manner, then uh, we're not doing business with them. 
and and so I'm sure many have perhaps even contacted some of you all but you know I think that's our responsibility to be good stewards of these resources and and ultimately not lose sight of the goal of making sure that our most vulnerable uh, in our community are fed and so that's kind of the the approach that we've taken well I, I'm glad to hear that I wouldn't doubt that you are, are doing the best um, to get us the best deals and the best food um, I know I appreciate it I know our residents will appreciate that as well um, uh, let me ask you about how somebody could access um, some of the additional programs that you're out offering especially those gaps um, so it's not the typical people that go to that site, or possibly it is, um, but I'm wondering, uh, is there uh, the way that they, they enroll in these programs, is it usually through a, a smartphone app, or do they need the internet to access this? I'm just concerned that many of our families in those same zip codes that we keep continue to bring up don't have the internet access um, uh, that they need to, to sign up. So how are we dealing with that? Yeah, everything from traditional means such as 211, uh, the Second Hardest Food Connect line, uh, the website. We also have through Silicon Valley Strong uh, an actual website where you can literally plug in your, your zip code and it'll, it'll give you a list of different options, all the way to, uh, you know, flyers, all the way to um, many of these distribution sites. They, 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 they're so um, visual that you can see what's happening in terms of food distribution and there's really no questions asked, right? If you have a need and you show up, um, we're gonna be able to help you, right? And one of the things that we've also added to this because, uh, and you know, sometimes it works better than other times, but not only are we assessing the need, but we're also geo-mapping where we're seeing uh, down ticks with some distribution sites to say, okay, wait a minute, these sites here have a little, are, are ending up with extra food. These sites are, 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 are running out sooner. So we're, we're literally in real time pivoting and, and working with Second Harvest Food Bank and our other partners to make those adjustments literally in real time. And of course, it, it varies from day to day. You know, one day you could have an uptick, next day it could be a downtick, but that's how um, fluid this has been. Uh, yeah. And again, my hats off to the team that is doing this uh, on the front lines. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I didn't know that um, Most Holy Trinity was one of those sites. And so it, it's as we connect with the, even, you know, I have internet access and I've access to all of you um, so that we can relay the right information to our residents. And so even, even if, you know, if I'm having a difficult time sometimes connecting to some of that. So I'd uh, love to get more information about some of the, the ways that our, our residents can get themselves uh, enrolled. We can speak offline, but I'm glad to hear that they're doing, you're doing it on the weekends because for, I think for my area around Welch, the weekends was one of the, the times where there was a real gap. Um, I think Evergreen School District has been doing a great job in um, providing lunches um, and breakfast to to those families without looking at any uh, uh, school enrollment or age or anything. And so they've been doing a fantastic job, but I know that they also are, are hurting. And so for me, it was a hope that they would somehow get um, compensated for some of what they're doing. Um, I know that there's San Jose Unified is getting, I think, a, it's, I think a three, a three million dollar um, contract, and so, um, and and I wonder why why is San Jose Unified? I think it's two point four million. Why is San Jose Unified having something exclusive to them? And then everybody else is going through Revolution Foods. Yeah. So, so, so let me. I think that's a that's a fair question. Let, let me explain kind of the context to that. When when this emergency first hit, San Jose Unified <clears throat> was one of the first school districts that that stood up and said, "Hey, you know, we're, we're ready to help, right?" And and quite frankly, at that point, we weren't really sure how to even address this whole food dis distribution strategy. What we what we worked uh, upon was we had a pre-existing uh, premise agreement with San Jose Unified. Based on the last flood and based on the last emergency, we started, one of the lessons learned was, you know what, we need to have some re-established or, or, re, or predefined 
uh, a premise and site use agreement so that the next time an emergency hits, we're, we're not having to kind of start from scratch. And, and quite frankly, Sounds of Unified was one of the first school districts where we were able to work that out and we actually had a pre-existing one. So building on that and the fact that they had 33 kitchens that they were ready to open up. And again, within that 33, you had sites like Lowell School, uh, Washington Elementary, Olander, you know, some of these very hotspots that we were talking about earlier. So it, it really became low hanging fruit, right? And, 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 we, and so that, that initial contract was really to just stand those sites up uh, and again, no questions asked because even at that point, USDA was still saying, well, we're not sure if we're going to fund this, right? So they actually said, well, let's take the risk. So we kind of took the risk together with Sounds of Unified. Uh, after a couple of weeks of doing that, then we realized, well, we can also, you know, we're going to have other school districts are going to have the same need. And that's when we reached out to Dr. Dewan and, uh, and we started working directly with her to coordinate uh, all our work with all the remaining school districts. And then kind of the rest is kind of history. But that, that was the one difference with Sounds of Unified. It was just right out the gate, they were ready to go and we were right there with them. Yeah, um, I, I hear you. I, I just don't know that they're always, that, it, that having a, re, uh, a past relationship uh, set up and make possibly an MOU or whatever it is that we needed to move forward quickly, that that aligns with the need. Mm -hmm. I know that there's some schools there that you mentioned that are absolutely in need. Um, I just don't know that it aligns perfectly with need um, because now we're we're moving into more of the, what you uh, said was the east side. Um, and um, knowing what we know now, um, I don't know that San Jose Unified, I would have supported something like that. Um, knowing that we we have the greater the greatest need and the people who are at, um, falling ill to this disease in um, in the east side rather than than San Jose Unified. Yeah. Council Member, if I could clarify, uh, it, it, it wasn't like we started with San Jose Unified and then weeks later we, we, we went over to east side. L literally we're talking days. We're talking starting with San Jose Unified and then within two or three days working with Franklin McKinley School District, Elm Rock, east side Union High School District. So I, I want to make it, 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 you know, maybe I didn't uh, you describe that accurately enough, but we're, we're talking literally days from the time that we started work with Sense of Unified and all the other sites. So there definitely was not a lapse of time uh, nor neglect of uh, vulnerable communities. In fact, our number one criteria was let's go where the need, need is first. And even with our partnerships with Sense of Unified, we honed in on those schools that we know uh, were very poverty stricken and more susceptible to uh, to economic challenges. And so I just, uh, you know, I, I probably didn't articulate that very clearly on the front end, but I want to be very clear that we have been very needs based from day one, from minute one of this uh, response. I'm glad to hear that. I, I of course, I, uh, Alamark and uh, Mount Pleasant are, some of those schools are in my district, but one of the schools that hardly ever gets connected is um, Evergreen School District, um, because the, I think the thought is that uh, most schools are, are well uh, off there. Um, but of course, that's a misnomer because you know that uh, there's plenty of schools in the uh, Evergreen School District that are in the 95122 uh, zip code. And uh, um, and I want to make sure that that can, I want to I need to advocate for them and so I want to make sure that when you think of the East Side you also think of Evergreen School District um, because they have been sharing with me that you know they are uh, like everybody else they're hurting and um, they would have appreciated a lot more support in what they're doing they've managed so far uh, to feed our families but um, but everybody so just. You know, keep that in the back of your mind that that when we say East Side Evergreen School District is part of that. It may not be the whole uh, district, but there's a, a number of schools that that fall into those need based. So those are my questions. I appreciate your answers. Um, I think that that is it. Thank you so much. Um, Council Member <coughs> Perales. Yeah, just um, uh, thank you as well for, for the update. Um, 
and just wanted to, to make one clarification um, that the 95116 zip code, about half of that actually does uh, reside in, in the District 3 area. Um, and, um, and in fact, a good chunk, as you were stating, Angel, of those individuals like Franklin McKinley School District um, area and um, everything sort of east of, of you know going to first street or 8070 you want to look at it um but but it is in the the article i think the depicted is, is east side uh it is the east side of district three um but it is a big portion of the individuals uh, as 95116 was denoted um right as one of those four zip codes that were hit the hardest and i know San Jose unified covers uh, a good swath of that um and so i, I do appreciate obviously that working with San Jose unified in in that regard um, you know, and as we know, um, you know, there's certainly uh, a lot of other needs we, we see coming out of those families as well, we've, as we've been trying to address with like uh, the, the technological uh, needs. And we know that um, they were behind the curve in that regard. So the fact that we have some, right, some uh, positive, positive news that um, there may have been prior agreements that allowed them um, to be slightly ahead of the curve on, on this distribution. Um, I think um, that, that that can't be said uh, for everything, um, but certainly what was uh, happy to see that. Um, and and again, thank you for your efforts on this. Um, we were hearing a little bit, which sounds like maybe some rumors that were debunked, um, but hearing that there may be, and, and you actually mentioned it, Angel, that some food distribution uh, that's going to certain sites, it may be, right, it, it could be too much one day or not enough in another location. How are you addressing that so that that way we are making the most of it? Uh, it sounded like you said you're addressing it uh, daily kind of as needed. Uh, can you give just a better description of that? Sure, sure, council member. So, so, so similar to the way we, you know, we, we developed a, a, a geo map starting with uh, the Second Harvest Food Bank data, and then we began to overlay schools, community-based organizations, churches, and so forth, and that gave us kind of these data points. Uh, using that same infrastructure, what, we, what we're starting to do is we're, we're assessing daily food counts on a daily basis. So uh, at each site, you know, we, they, they'll report in and they'll say, hey, we, we, we met the need or we were over by, you know, 100, we were under by 60, you know, and so that's been reported on a daily basis. We're taking those data points and then we're geomapping it through the same infrastructure and it's telling us, Hey, look, there's uh, there, there's less demand over here. There's growing demand over here. There's a gap, and then based on that data, we're we're actually working because we have three weekly check-ins: one with nonprofit partners, one with cities, and then one with a, a larger uh, a policy advisory team. And and between those three groups, we're, we're pivoting. Uh, at the at the site level, though, we we've we've asked our uh, what we call them as a, a food account managers to basically monitor that in real time. And then they're working directly with food distribution to make those, um, make those pivots uh, on a daily basis in real time. Now, as you know, when you do that, you may be off by one or two days, right? Uh, um, but nonetheless, we're able to, to track. Um, and, and so, so far as we've been testing that, uh, and it's pretty impressive, I, I'd be more than happy to share this with in, in, any of you. I could you know, send you a copy of the map that we use or perhaps at one of our future uh, report outs, I could kind of highlight that. But that's, how, that's what we're using now um, to assess that need. Thank you uh, for that, Yo. I think we were getting some rumors that uh, you know, food may be getting wasted because, you know, too much is going from one side or the other. Uh, so it's uh, good to just hear uh, how you are addressing that day to day. But those are my questions. Uh, Council Member Foley. Thank you very much. Uh, first, uh, I, Lee, I want to appreciate uh, the words that you said about the budget and for once, I'm actually getting and understanding all the different pots of money that are related to the coronavirus relief fund, whether they're the reimbursable type from FEMA or the other pots. I, I, I'm finally, it's, it's a light bulb finally went on in my head today. So now it's crystal clear until you say something else and confuse me a little bit. So I thank you for that. But uh, I really want to talk about the food distribution and uh, I, I just can't, I need to, I feel 
that I need to respond about the comments of San Jose Unified. San Jose Unified stepped up in a huge way to distribute many meals throughout the city of San Jose, and they were prepared to do so based on their central kitchen and their major food distribution uh, procedures. We, our council members should trust that no one is making money on this. This is not a profit center for San Jose Unified. I'm sure it's costing them money to make the distributions that they are. And I just wanted to highlight some of the schools that are also in the zip codes that you're talking about, but also in downtown that are highly impacted by poverty and crowded living conditions, such as Washington Elementary, Lowell, Grant, San Jose High, Bachrot, Empire Gardens, Horace Mann, right across the street from, from City Hall, and Ann, and Ann Darling. All those, and I know I've probably missed someone, but as board member, I'm trying to lit, former board member trying to list them out on that are on the west side of our east side of uh, District 3. And then over actually on the other side of 101 is uh, Ann Darling. So this, please make no mistake and please don't, uh, let's all work together with our schools and not uh, put one in competition with the other. They are doing a yeoman's effort of providing food all over the city including in District 9, who surprisingly enough has tremendous amount of need for, for people who uh, ha need to have access to food as well. So please let's support our schools and support everyone together. We are all in this together and no one is making a dollar on this. That's all I have to say, thank you. Thank you, council member. Uh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, can you hear me? I can, thanks. Hi, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, kind of add to, uh, as you were talking about this item with 3.1, um, uh, the statistical information sounds like could be incredibly needed and useful in, in this work that you're talking about with food distribu distribution. And, you know, to try to be fair, I, I, I shouldn't fully blame the federal government and the Trump administration but, you know, to try to give the county a break, you know, I, I imagine their hands are being tied by the federal government uh, agencies a bit. And, um, you know, I, I just, I, I really feel for, for your condition and what you're trying to work through and, um, you know, how we, I, I've, 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 I've described my feelings uh, to yourselves, how, how it's frustrating. You can't get openness and accountability from your own government. And it, feels like that's what you're going through as well and uh, you know it's a real push and pull to try to uh, you know bring about you know good ideas I mean I really wish you luck with FEMA and what uh, how you can talk with FEMA about uh, you know the distribution of, of money and what what is exactly should be considered as, as allowable and uh, it's a part of the, the renters uh, rights issues and, and, and owners rights issues that we're going through you know how to work that out, and uh, you know there has to be a there has to be different interpretations. Uh, so it's going to be a really tough couple of next couple of years, and I and and as difficult as things are, I hope we can learn to just make really open observations about things about people how people are hurting and, and learn to apply you know good practices. So I, I wish you luck in how we're all going to try to do that at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Arenas. Council Member Arenas. I believe you're. Uh... I want to make sure um, to, to clear up that I'm not pitting one school uh, against another. I'm doing my job as a council member, and that is to advocate for my district. And so if I see another district um, being treated, differently so it's my job to speak up and say so and I didn't say anything that um, you suggested council member Foley and so please do not put words into my mouth or twist the messages that I have uh, stated and that is asking and advocating for my own district and that is it thank you uh, Councilmember Sparsa um, 
Move, I don't, I didn't hear a motion, so move approval. Second. Thank you. Motion from Council Member Sparza. Uh, I had a couple questions about, um, I guess this goes back to the 3.1 as well, uh, but it's all kind of wrapped up, the same cost, uh, the same pots of money here. Our projections are we could be spending as much as $42 million on emergency shelter. And I know that some of this fund may likely be used as a source if FEMA doesn't come through for us. And I know that particularly the motel room, uh, usage of motel rooms has been challenged, I think in lots of cities um, and we're not fully utilizing. I believe we're still not doing so here in San Jose as well. Correct me if I'm wrong on that, Lee. Maybe we are now, but it's been a challenge. Is, I'm just wondering, as we're looking at the 42 million projection through December of, of, of this year, um, is there a concern that we may be spending here where we're just not getting full utilization? Um, no, I, I wouldn't say there's a concern where I, I that we wouldn't um, use full utilization. I'd say our concern is, and, and Jim can speak to it, I think how we maximize every single one of those dollars is, <clears throat> what we choose to fund out of the coronavirus relief fund is important that we can spend that money in this year. So any of the funds that we have had set aside originally to to help offset some of those expenses, we'd like to save and whatever we need to kind of continue operationally past December 31st, we can hold that in the general fund or reserve. So we want to, you know, especially with knowing the shelter system and the emergency uh, housing system that that can't be closed down immediately. We've been able to build in demobilization costs, but also front the money that's important that needs to be spent this year. So we keep the ongoing operational dollars we have for those sites past December 31st of this year. And Jim, I don't know if you, you wanted to expand on that in any way. I think the, o the only thing I would add, Lee, is yeah, we, we don't have a lot of funds after January 1st to kind of meet what we know are gonna be ongoing needs. We're, we're dealing with two crises. We're dealing with the COVID emergency and we have an intersecting shelter crisis and that isn't going to go away come January. So it, it, this is our effort to try and have our solutions address both of those crises. Thanks, Jim. Um, and then Lee, on the, on the FEMA um, <coughs> reimbursement, I know it's, it was challenging news for us a couple of weeks ago, but we, we knew we had these risks. We went in this eyes wide open. Um, are we hearing anything from our team um, in legislative affairs about whether or not there is some hope um, from the speaker's office or anywhere else around changing the FEMA reimbursement rules through the next CARES Act legislation? So there's, yeah, there's kind of two parts of that. On the larger FEMA reimbursement system, it sounds like the speaker and everyone else have said, We'd like to focus on the negotiations on what was CARES Act 2.0, which is now HEROES. Uh, I need to get used to that, sorry. Um, so they'd like to have an initial focus on that. But with that said, as, as a reminder, in that original CARES Act, additional dollars went into the public assistance um, fund for FEMA, for cities to be able to reimburse costs. And there is a section, we're still trying to analyze the bill because it came out this morning. It does look like it's possibly changing criteria to be a bit more flexible, but we can update as, as, as we read, read through the 700 pages of the bill. Great, thanks Lee. Um, I'd be happy, please let me know as, <laughs> as you're hearing things. I know we'll be talking with Senator Harris tomorrow and uh, we'll have an ongoing conversation on these issues. So let me know how we can push. I did Thank know you. that FEMA does allow reimbursement for what they call high risk populations, which includes people over 65, which is a really large percentage of our population, any city's population. And um, I know that we've set aside, it looked like the breakdown, I'm trying to look at, pull up the memo here, uh, the breakdown on how we are setting money aside for this three sources looked like a pretty small share. Uh, it looked like it was, yeah, just Team San Jose, World Central Kitchen, and Health Trust that were, it's the 5.9 million mm -hmm. relative to the 26.8 million, if you go to page 10, that we're kind of putting in that FEMA reimbursable pot. And I'm just wondering if we were to really 
considering how many seniors we must be serving. Is that, do you think we're undershooting there? So I, I will say we are probably undershooting. One of the things that we do, so we, we've, we've got this news from FEMA as of last week, hey, this is what we intend to do. Yeah. We intend, or we've been told later tonight or first thing tomorrow that we will actually better understand what we are gonna be reimbursed in that next, um, in our first package for the first 30 days. And until then, nothing has been final. So as, as Kit mentioned last week, um, uh, we let it be known with FEMA that we were unhappy with their judgment call and did make um, some rather large statements about kind of the, the point that you're bringing up right now, Mayor, and that we'd like to see that move forward. But for the purposes of budgeting, yes, we went with a very conservative approach. If the reimbursement comes in uh, better, we can backfill the coronavirus relief funds and then and, and backfill uh, the general fund as well. So we, we can fix that as we move forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, and appreciate um, concerns about making sure that we're getting food to the those who are who need the food the most. And I, I just want to commend staff on being so proactive in that effort, uh, Angel, and, and everybody on the team. Uh, as I've had an opportunity to go out to sites, um, look, we can't know whether or not we're really satisfying the need. In fact, I, I think we can probably confidently say we're not. We can't possibly satisfy all the need, but I think. Uh, we're doing a pretty darn good job of of hustling hard to try to understand where that need is and get it there. And and I, I think that it is um, problematic when we rely too much on geography to assess where need might be. Uh, we are a diverse city. I think Councilmember Foley made that point very well. Um, you know, San Jose Unified's enrollment is majority Latino, um, more than two thirds uh, minority students. Uh, I know those many of those neighborhoods very well in the downtown. Uh, and I, I also know, I just went online to look at Evergreen Elementary School District uh, on point2homes.com, which is, I guess, the only data source I've found. And average household income in that school district is 167,000. So I, I think it's, it's important for us to recognize that geography is not completely destiny here, uh, that we have need in lots of parts of our city. Uh, and, it, and it comes in, in, in different zip codes, and we ought to be, you know, we, we do need to be astute to that as well. There's no question San Jose Unified is serving many needy students. Um, Councilmember Esparza? Yeah, I, I just, I wanted to, I feel like a lot is coming out today, and I want to just emphasize that Everything that we do as a city, everything that we've been doing has been to the North Star of meeting the need. Um, and so that's what we should stay focused on and objectively look at where the need, acknowledging that there are needs across the city and that um, anything that we do, um, we should be able to scale citywide. Um, and that ultimately that we should meet the need. and and. With respect to what you just said, I um, I agree with you in the spirit of what you just said because I think um, you know you referenced some neighborhoods like we we had been when we talked about the digital divide we talked about Washington right because it's not next to a high school so it's a pocket that we all um, are concerned about serving because they weren't connected they didn't have a high school connection and. So there have been discussions at the city to do that. But just, you know, I really ask that we stick to where the need is and there is geographic need, right? Whether it's the studies, the public health studies, the, the juvenile probation studies, through any measure, we know where the need is across the city. In some things, we know that the need is greatest in certain zip codes, including 95122, 95116. Those are two zip codes that come up consistently. And so I just, I realize that, you know, we have a lot of people working hard. We've all been working seven days a week, whether you're a council member, council member staff, city staff, everybody has been working really hard. But ultimately our goal and our conversations should be focused on meeting the need of the residents who are depending on all of us um, to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 
on that point. Uh, I think that's that's all the, the comments. Uh, we have a motion. Let's vote on the motion, Tony. Jimenez? Perales? Yes. Aye. Diep? Aye. Carrasco? Yes. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Item 4.1 are actions related to the 2019 Bay Area uh, UASI grant agreement. There's no presentation. Are there any questions? Uh, Move to approve. Second. Motion from Councilmember Sparza. Mr. Beekman? Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? We can. Thank you. Okay, I have a speech all prepared for this one. Uh, although they may have a terrible name, I would like to thank the overall work and efforts of Bay Uasi. They are part of HITDA and the DHS. They have been trying to develop more uh, stable practices and better communication for several years now, and are currently trying to develop better public access and participation with programs like SF Card and Cater in Santa Clara County. Overall, I hope you can read uh, this speech in expanded form in the RAOG public record next week. The November 2019 Bayouasi Approval Authority public meeting can be an important lesson for all of us, I feel, and of help in how to continually look for and develop open, accessible ideas of what can be the public process. This is how everyday people and government uh, at all levels can practice good democracy and bureaucratic oversight and feel it can be a smart, intelligent, and safe way to learn how to better offer their own good voice and how to better report and better listen to when one feels local, state, national, and international situations are growing too violent, warlike, unstable, unjust, or extreme. Thank you. Uh, with my remaining time, I, I wanted to ask you uh, questions about, um, on your memo, you describe you know, certain projects as usual that, that you're getting uh, funding for by Bayouasi, but it mentions a, a funding of uh, $400,000 $400, that you're just being given to in money. And I, I haven't really noticed that before. I don't quite know the depth of that. Uh, I'm just asking here. But it's with, it's with that, that uh, with my remaining 20 seconds, you, you're talking, starting to talk in terms of waterfall money that's going to be coming to you at this time. I mean, I think we're going to be going through an awful lot in the next couple of years. And I hope that as, as government, you start to really explain that to the public, what we're going to be going through, and, and to make them aware how to be open to thought about, you know, the changes we're going to be talking about, or just to be open to, a, a, you know, the short-term changes. Thank you. Thank you. On the motion, um, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Aye. Diep? Aye. Crosco? Yes. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Aye. Jones? Aye. Ricardo? Aye. Thank you. Uh, item 5.1 are amendments to concession agreements for temporary financial relief to concessionaires at Benetti International. There's no presentation here. Uh, anyone like to speak or make a motion? I'll move approval. I'll second. Second. Thank you, Councilmember Davis, for putting us out of our measure here. <laughs> uh, Councilmember Menace. I just wanted to say uh, thank you so much to John Aiken for uh, for putting forward the effort. It seems I'm hoping something has changed since you uh, provided this memo, but uh, I haven't heard anything from some of the representatives of the employees, so I assume uh, they're all on board or or just having those conversations. So thank you so much for the work. John, did you want to respond? Uh, sure, Mr. Mayor, Council Member John Aiken, Director of Aviation. Um, we have uh, confirmed with both the union and with um, the concessionaires that they are talking and continuing to talk. Um, the council member is correct. There's not a huge amount of movement, but I think uh, the idea from last month was that we get the two at the table and get them to talk and be constructive 
and, and do what they can do. And so we're continuing to uh, try and encourage them to stay at the table uh, and, and look at opportunities to help the employee staff out. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think that's all that we desired. So I think uh, to the extent that they're talking and that continues, I think it bodes well for everyone involved. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the motion then is from Council Member Davis. Uh, Tony? Menez? Aye. Prowlis? Aye. Diep? Aye. Crosco? Yes. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Chemist? Yes. Jones? Aye. Mayor Licardo? Aye. Thank you. All right, uh, action, uh, I'm sorry, item 8.2, our actions related to HOPWA and uh, CARES Act supplemental grant from USH, US HUD. Uh, we have no presentation on this item, but we're happy to take their money. Move approval. Second. Uh, I see no members of the public like to speak. I see no hands being raised. Uh, let's vote, Tony. Jimenez. Aye. Perales? Aye. Diep? Aye. Crosco? Yes. Davis? Aye. Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Chemis? Yes. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye, but I now see someone just raised their hand. Uh, that was a person with a, uh, a phone number ending in 8967. Uh, please unmute yourself. Welcome, everyone has two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and Council. My name is Bianca Wilshock, and I am the managing partner of a local small minority and woman-owned business with a restaurant at the San Jose International, excuse me, International Bianca, Airport. I'm sorry, forgive me, ma'am. I, I think you yes. really intend to speak on 5.1 because I, I saw your letter. That was submitted to the oh, council. Okay, my apologies. My apologies. I, I should tell you that item was approved unanimously. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Beekman. Hi, thank you. I'll try to make this short. I just I discovered uh, in talking about the last subject, uh, I don't quite know how to how to frame it, frame my words yet, but I'm really hoping uh, you know, as as I stated before, you know there's going to be changes in the next couple of years. How do we talk about those changes in positive terms? Um, how can we make it realistic and relevant and just, you know, commonplace? And um, that's, that's what I'm asking of yourselves as, as city government can, you know, we're, we're ending the first phase of, of, of COVID things. We're about to enter the second and third phases, you know, and this will include, you know, how can we work quickly to, you know, put shelter in place back in place if, if it comes up again this fall. And, you know, I, we have a whole new series of things we have to adjust to and be ready for and ways to accept, uh, you know, ways to accept, you know, that uh, I, I really think that tenants and owners are going to have a hard time repaying their debts. And we, we, there has to be debt forgiveness plans and ways to go about that making an open process to talk about and, and constructive. And um, I think that, you know, I hope you can be up to that responsibility to help us out with that and really, you know, just show us and just and teach us and give us good instructional ideas. And, and your, your public will just, you know, work well with it and, and work with you totally, I think. And, uh, you know, the idea is a trust and, and it'll be good stuff. And, that last words were really ugly. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, it's just a matter of, you know, building trust and an intelligent conversation and, 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 you know, that'll keep it from the riots and all that stuff. And uh, so good luck in those efforts and, and how to relate to us. I mean, it's a really big picture for the next couple of years and how to bring that down to concise, intelligent terms is important. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, would anyone like to change their vote in light of the public testimony that they've heard? I'm not seeing anyone raise their hand. Okay, uh, we're gonna move on then to item 8.4, which are actions related to temporary sheltering operations and services for COVID-19 emergency response. There is no presentation here. 
Um, actually, there, actually, there is going to be a presentation. Yeah, I think okay. we. Yep. Excellent. Hi, Jackie. Hi. Sorry. I'm going to try to do the share screen now. Uh, sorry. Jackie, is it something that maybe you might want to email to us that we could share? It is posted, Mayor, just to let you. So it is posted now on the, the uh, agenda website. So it is okay. there. Henry's going to try to pull it up. That'll make it easier. Sorry, it kicked me off. <laughs> I'm back. <laughs> Sorry about that. I will try to start again, and if it does not work, I will just uh, do the present. Ah, it works now. Thank you. Excellent. There. We're all becoming Zoom experts. I know. Unfortunately, I'm not as. All right. Well, here I am. I'm Jackie Morales Moran. Sorry for that awkward pause there. I am with uh, Reagan Henninger, who is our deputy director, and we're here to uh, provide you an overview of the COVID-19 emergency response that we're going to be providing at Kelly Park. So um, I, I always have the opportunity to listen to the city manager's opening remarks, and I was able to do that today and heard uh, the discussion you had regarding the city's approach and council member Adenis's request that she hoped that we would uh, frame future approaches uh, given what we given what you all discussed today and so I just wanted to let you know I had that opportunity to hear that and so I'm uh, I added this slide to my presentation so um, as the city manager's office and the whole EOC has continued to emphasize the approach has always been we are trying to save lives, lives and we are prioritizing the most vulnerable people in our community who are most vulnerable to COVID-19. And when we're thinking about saving lives, as we have stated earlier, we understand that COVID-19, it, it presents a global public health emergency and responding it to it requires a public health lens. And our public health priorities are prevention. The goal is to prevent the spread of this disease and the prevention of early death. A key strategy to our approach in the city is to target our prevention efforts towards our most vulnerable residents. We know that COVID-19 poses increased risk for certain populations, including older adults and those with underlying severe health conditions, and that COVID-19 is having a disproportionate impact of communities of color, both nationally and locally. The homeless population is one key vulnerable population. Vulnerability to a disease, which includes the lack of housing and the inability to meet basic sanitary requirements, such as the simple act of washing your hands, um, makes it impossible for people who are living on the streets to combat COVID-19 effectively. In addition, we know that many a significant number of homeless people have a poor health conditions. The uh, VHHP doctors who are the doctors that work in treating our homeless population have already identified close to 2,500 people who meet the definition of vulnerable with poor health conditions who are homeless. 
As you all discussed earlier today, people of color are disproportionately represented, and in our homeless population, this is also true. An evaluation of race and homelessness in Santa Clara County conducted by the Destination Home Group found that there are disproportionately high rates of homelessness among specific racial and ethnic groups in the city of San Jose and Santa Clara County. Unique to Santa Clara County, people who identify as Hispanic and Latinx comprise 43.7% of the homeless population compared to 27% of the general population and 65% of families presenting to the coordinated entry system are Hispanic or Latinx. Black and African Americans are also dis disproportionately represented in the homeless population, representing 16.9% compared to their general population numbers of 2.5%. And finally, I would argue that homelessness is not just an individual person's problem or their moral failure to pull themselves out of poverty. Homelessness is primarily a structural problem. We have a lack of affordable housing, healthcare, quality jobs, in addition to increasing poverty, an ineffective criminal justice system, welfare system, and institutionalized racism. Our emergency housing solutions don't solve all of these issues. But during COVID-19, the administration is doing everything we can to increase the shelter opportunities to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to save the lives of our homeless residents who are vulnerable to this disease. And we're doing this, this is one of our efforts, which is our, the Cal OES trailers. Um, in March 19th and 20th, the city received 104 trailers that came within 24 hours, we had to find a location for the site. Uh, when we received the trailers, we did a, a complete walkthrough to look at their conditions and realize that a significant number of them needed repairs. Um, the state also mandated how we can use these trailers as part of the condition of providing them to us. And in order to use them, someone has to be homeless and they have to meet one of these three conditions. They either have to be COVID-19 positive, they have to be a person under investigation, or they have to be high risk. We are proposing for the site that we use it for to house people who are high, high risk. Uh, in terms of just giving you a very brief overview of what, uh, how these will be managed, uh, the primary purpose of them is to provide an ability for people who are homeless to actually comply with our shelter in place order. And so as a result, there's not going to be any guests or visitors allowed. We're gonna provide daily health screening, temperature checks and wellness checks, meaning we're going to be checking in on residents at their actual trailers to make sure they're okay. And our approach, even though we can uh, provide shelter for 90, people at this time. We're going to start with 30, make sure that phase is working properly, and then we're going to open up another 30 and then open our final 30. And then finally, there's been a question about security, and we plan to have 24-7 private security at the site with a controlled entrance so that everyone who attempts to come in has to be screened. And then finally, our plan for demobilizing the site is really looking at two approaches or two issues. We want to make sure that there's a sufficient contain, um, containment of COVID-19 and that there are places where we can actually transition these vulnerable tenants. And then we're also aware that Happy Hollow Park is going to want to open and we want to plan our demobilization so that we are uh, closely tracking what's happening with Happy Hollow and uh, whether it's uh, and how much it can open up and at what time. So with that, we are open to questions. Thank you, Jackie. All right, uh, going to the community. Uh, I know there were some members probably like to speak. Beginning with Kathy, welcome. Hello. Um, in light of what she just spoke about, um, I even have more concern. Okay. First of all, um, who, th who thought this idea was a good idea is beyond me. 
there are very many, a lot of points for me to make about this. Children, families looking forward to visiting Happy Hollow Park and Zoo year after year, especially those that have memberships already paid or are first timers. This is a major health concern to anyone nearby, but also to our precious zoo animals. Um, what if, I don't like to be negative, a homeless person with COVID-19 climbs over the fence, gets into the zoo and infects our animals, okay? Did you ever think about that? The Happy Hollow Foundation was not notified, consulted, pros or cons about this crazy idea. The sponsors, donors would not even have cons um, considered this, okay? There are plenty of other locations within the whole city and county, yes, by working together, Homeless are not, I repeat, not bound by San Jose versus Santa Clara, okay? Example, why would you put the, why, why couldn't you put the trailers, since this is a, car, a parking example, in uh, the uh, fairgrounds, okay? Their parking lot. Another example, golf courses. There are some owned by the city of San Jose. There's no animals or people around there, only lots of grass and big space, okay? These with some work, yes, working together, we have been, as we've been doing, health, sheltering at home, trailers can be moved to a more appropriate location. Please, this is, it, it's not too late to move these trailers immediately before there could be a worse situation. Do you want Happy Hollow Park and Zoo to reopen as soon as possible or not? As many others are questioning this at this point. This is crazy. And who decided this in the first place to place them there? is beyond me. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I believe Amy Pizarro. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Amy Pizarro. I'm the executive director of Happy Hollow Foundation. Um, first of all, I'm proud to live in a city whose leaders go to extraordinary lengths to protect its most vulnerable citizens. The trailers installed in Happy Hollow's East parking lot are a symbol of San Jose's admirable whatever it takes attitude to save lives. But when guidance from the county allows Happy Hollow to begin the process of reopening, the exit plan for the trailers must kick in without delay. There's a lot of speculation about the level of gathering people will be comfortable with in the months to come, but one thing is clear, they will want to go outside. And Happy Hollow can serve an important role in helping our community recover from this difficult period by providing a safe place for outdoor recreation and education. We're preparing to welcome back guests at appropriate numbers and ramp up over time. So we know there can be a period of overlap when the trailers are present after the park reopens. But it is essential to limit this overlap because we can't resume full operations without that parking lot. Additionally, due to its urban location and proximity to the Coyote Creek homeless encampment, Happy Hollow has already faced unfortunate security incidents involving guests and animals. Multiple people in our community have contacted me to express concerns about the security risks posed by the trailers. And as the recovery from the Coyote Creek flood in 2017 showed us, easy decisions and changes can take months to complete, especially when complicated by the involvement of the federal government. Happy Hollow provides something unique and precious, a safe outdoor space for children to explore, play and learn while surrounded by the majesty of animals in nature. We must preserve this and give it back to our community as soon as it is safe to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you. Vicky uh, Bowers, uh, Malk, please forgive me if I mispronounced your last name, Vicky. That's okay. Can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Right. Um, my name is Vicki Bozmach, and first off, I just wanna say thank you to the mayor and city council and the entire team at City Hall for working so hard to keep our community safe and healthy during COVID-19. I'm speaking to you as a mom, a community member, and the board president of Happy Hollow Foundation. I treasure Happy Hollow as a safe and beautiful space for our community. We like to refer to it as our happy little corner of San Jose. Our job at the foundation is to support Happy Hollow, and that's why I'm speaking to you today. I'm concerned about the trailers in the east parking lot, and I'm baffled about why they are only now being filled with residents, just as the county is starting to loosen restrictions and Happy Hollow is making plans to reopen as soon as county orders allow. I applaud the efforts of the city to help our most vulnerable citizens, but the presence of this temporary shelter will absolutely hinder Happy, Hollow, Happy Hollow's ability to reopen fully. Families are clamoring to get back to Happy Hollow when safe conditions return, and we must ensure they feel safe doing so. 
Surely this cannot be planned as a long-term solution here, especially when there are other locations available that will have less impact on San Jose's families. Please make it a high priority to define the exit strategy and to implement it as soon as possible after county orders allow Happy Hollow to reopen. We must minimize the impact on Happy Hollow, its animals, and the families who love it. Thank you. Thank you. Ingrid Granados. Welcome, if you could unmute yourself. Good afternoon, honorable mayor and council members. My name is Ingrid Granados and I'm speaking on behalf of Destination Home. We're here to speak in support of utilizing the state provided shelter trailers to help house vulnerable homeless residents during this pandemic. We know that the spread of COVID-19 can be particularly dangerous for those experiencing homelessness. Individuals without stable housing not only face greater difficulty taking preventative actions, but they are often in poorer health than others. We're incredibly grateful for the extraordinary efforts of the San Jose Housing Department team, the county's Office of Supportive Housing, and our Continuum of Care partners to quickly add more than a thousand temporary shelter beds, medical respite beds, and hotel rooms to our temporary shelter inventory. However, we know that the need is even greater in our community and that we must utilize every opportunity to bring folks indoors during this crisis. That's why we urge the council to approve the housing department's recommendation to utilize these 90 trailers to house some of the most vulnerable neighbors during this unprecedented crisis. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Mr. Bigman. Hi, thank you. Um, to speak to the FEMA trailers themselves, uh, you know, thank you that you that you have these trailers. And I think it speaks to, uh, you know, there's a certain uh, progressive open philosophy that, that FEMA has, uh, you know, they can work with things well and they're open to working with things well. So I wish you luck in how you're going to talk with FEMA and what sounds like to me is, you know, your needs are, you know, COVID based. And um, as, you know, many things can be interpreted as, as needed to be COVID based and that, that becomes a sticky point. And, but I think FEMA, you know, they can be open to negotiation. You know, I think these same ideas have to be involved with how to talk about tenants' rights and owners' rights, uh, mortgage rights. And so good luck in, in those efforts. Um, you know, it's the same sort of thing of how we're gonna have to talk about very large uh, rent and owner forgiveness packages in the next year. And these are in the same sort of conversations that I feel are just vital to our human needs at this time and uh, you know, our, our human health and welfare. So good luck in how to deal with the Happy Hollow issue uh, overall, and, and um, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Council Member Sparta. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have one of my Happy Hollow backgrounds here behind me um, uh, for today's meeting. Um, so first, I, uh, I do want to address how the trailers got there. I know it was part of the presentation, um, but I want the community to, you know, I think some things get lost. These trailers arrived pretty early on in the COVID response. Um, the city received a call from the California Office of Emergency Services um, saying the trailers are on their way. <laughs> Um, and the trailers were intended to expand the safety net for the health and hospital system here in Santa Clara County. And so we are fortunate enough not to need it for that initial surge as we had planned, but the use tonight still complies with the intent for the FEMA trailers, but it's taken a few weeks to get here. And again, I just want to emphasize that we are lucky to be going from a situation where we thought as a county that we would need to expand every uh, available opening for people recovering from COVID, including, by the way, trailers in my own district at the county fairgrounds where there are folks um, with COVID living there now. And so, um, so I just want that to be clear to everyone that of the intent of the trailers and how that happened. 
um, and why that's important. Um, so first, I actually, before I get to some questions, I wanted to thank everybody um, from the initial EOC team that got a call from the, um, the governor's uh, OES office um, saying we're on our way to the um, public works, to PRNS, to housing. Um, and there have been so many people involved in this um, over a several week period. So thank you um, for everyone that has been doing that and trying to keep saving lives our top priority. Um, and so um, I wanted to go over a few points one is uh, just to make it very clear that I understand the population being served at this site will be under unhoused um, or unhoused neighbors with underlying health conditions such as cancer, diabetes, and heart disease. So can you talk a little bit, I don't know who wants to address um, the fact that we have people with health conditions who are at risk of dying from COVID who are going into these trailers. Is that correct? That's correct. And maybe I'll just say, yeah, Reagan, Reagan is in our joint oh, operations hi. center with the county. So Reagan, if you wouldn't mind taking that, that'd be great. Hi, good afternoon, council member. We have a, um, a centralized referral process that's uh, jointly operated by the County Office of Supportive Housing and Valley Homeless Healthcare Program and it is closely coordinated with the city of San Jose. I sit in the joint uh, departmental operations center with both of those entities. And so our referral system is, um, is handled by VHHP and OSH. And VHHP has doctors and nurses who are triaging people to understand their vulnerability and assess for those pre-existing health conditions, as you just mentioned, diabetes, cancer. Um, and so we're prioritizing for this site, people who are older and have three or more of those pre-existing health conditions, which would make them extremely vulnerable if they were to contract COVID-19. So these are the people who would have serious complications if they were to contract COVID-19, if not even potentially um, be fatal for them if they were to contract it. And, um, and so uh, having said that, um, I wanted to ask what our exit plan is, right? Because there's a distinction between the trailers at Happy Hollow and some of the other, uh, I think, the words can get confusing. So for some of the interim housing measures, we've talked about trailers and tiny homes and bridge housing communities. This is different, correct? So one, this is different. And then two, what is the exit plan? I don't think, um, you know, I, given that this is a temporary measure, I, I am interested in what that process is once we do close down that we are able to prioritize if they are vulnerable, right, vulnerable enough to be at Happy Hollow, that we are able to prioritize them to um, housing, a next, whether it's interim or permanent housing. Let, let me begin, Council Member, and then I'll ask maybe Jackie and Reagan to add to it. Um, we have two different types of emergency housing that we have stood up or are standing up in our city. Um, we have emergency temporary housing, which Parkside Hall, um, South Hall, and the Camden uh, Community Center, and then the trailers are in that category, temporary. That means we've put them up in locations where there is a different use where they've been stood up, whether it's a convention activity, a parking lot, a community center, and the like. So they're clearly temporary. So it's emergency temporary uh, shelter and housing. And then we're also in the process of building emergency interim housing at the Bernal site, and we're developing at Evans Lane, and then at Rue Ferrari. Um, that's emergency interim housing, and that will both serve a purpose during the COVID emergency, but
but it will also transition for our shelter crisis as well after we've moved past the COVID crisis. So this particular location, the trail location, is in the temporary category. We recognize there is a different purpose for the underlying land and location, and we will need to move it um, when we're prepared to, when the uh, COVID pandemic in our city has moved past those most significant stages, where we're confident we don't need it uh, for at-risk populations, and also at a time when the Happy Hollow Park and Zoo is ready to reopen and needs that capacity. So we're basing it on kind of both of those factors as Jackie uh, outlined in her presentation. So that's at a high level kind of how we're managing uh, the two different types or categories. Uh, in, in terms of a, a decommissioning strategy, um, I think Jackie from the get-go has encouraged our EOC branch to really be preparing for decommissioning on these temporary facilities. So we're working through that process. Um, on this particular location, we have to make a determination whether we're just going to put the trailers in storage, uh, whether we would send them back to Cal OES, or whether we'd stand them up to become ultimately an emergency interim housing site somewhere else in the city, but it'll require us to identify those locations. We're in the process of kind of constantly evaluating sites. So we're working on that now. We're looking at that now, um, but we are in process on that. We don't have a specific location either to put them in storage or ultimately stand them up, but that's something that we're absolutely prioritizing and we'll be addressing uh, in the near future. Um, in terms of placing them in other shelter locations, maybe I'll ask Jackie or Reagan to, to step in and kind of describe the planning and thinking on that front. So we are planning with the county. The county has been our, part, has been our partner from the beginning of our uh, creation of a strategy. So we have begun discussions on where we can transition people. One of the opportunities is with these longer term BHC sites could be a possibility. And so we're certainly keeping that open as one potential transition point. Okay, thank you. I just, um, I think uh, as we stand up interim measures, we need to really look at our capacity to include the people that we're sheltering now um, in order to avoid taking somebody who is moving from the streets into a shelter because they're vulnerable to going back out on the streets to just to make that connection as we stand up tiny homes or the tr other trailers um, that we are able to kind of make those connections so we don't start from zero i have a 162 unit permanent supportive housing development um, that opened up a few months ago in my district and We've been phasing people in throughout the COVID um, crisis, and I checked with them to see if they had openings um, for the trailer folks, but um, they tell me that they're, uh, even though not everybody's moved in yet, that they're full plus a waiting list. And so, you know, I, I just wanna ensure that we are attempting to have an exit plan for folks as we take them in um, into the trailer. Um, I had a, a couple of other questions more about the site, and um, I'm not sure um, who can answer my questions. Um, I think a couple of the speakers and people in the community have brought up security. Um, can you talk a little bit about the security who is going and who is going to be providing it? Are they already familiar with the location? Um, and because it's it's a broad area. So what will that look like? I can take that. So the, the we're using a private security firm, uh, First Alarm, and there'll be uh, eight officers on site. We have put a, a temporary fence around the entire site. So there's only one entrance and exit to the site which will be staffed by the security firm at all times. The, um, 
so guests are residents who stay at the trailer site will be required to go through security um, every time they enter the site as will any um, vendors who may be coming on site like um, our mobile health care units even the abode staff who might be coming on site or city staff who would be coming on site the security will also be patrolling the perimeter of the site uh, also checking the fence that we've erected for any um, tampering or breaking of the fence because we do want it to be a secure site we don't want people um, trying to go through the fence or around it and they'll also um, be conducting fire watch at the site is that a helpful council member yes thank you um and i had another question about the uh physical location um which is how will happy hollow be restored so for example the cap uh somehow that was trenched on site um so how will the parking lot be restored um, to its um, original state before the trailers went in? And is that part of the plan moving forward? Yeah, that's part of the demobilization plan, council member, was enough time to take down everything that's been put on site. Um, everything that's been put on site is removable. So, um, you know, nothing's been added underground. Uh, the electrical is all above ground. Uh, so it's, again, it's all removable. Uh, but as we've said in our staff report, it will um, take some time to remove the the trailers and take down the equipment. We're estimating 30 to 60 days. Okay. okay. In terms of preparing, that's one of the things that, you know, once we have it up and running, we can immediately then begin to start planning what are going to be all the steps we need to do in order to remove everything uh, once we need to do that so that we're fully informed of what the requirements are and can better refine the timing and so will that process um, be worked through with prns and the happy hollow foundation so operationally those things can all be worked out timing wise yes we coordinate quite uh closely with um across a number of departments including prns but also public works who is responsible for um, demobilizing a lot of that equipment that's been placed on site. So it's actually coordination amongst several um, departments who will be um, taking down equipment, removing fences, placing the trailers to their um, to their next site. Okay. Thank you. Um, and I'd also um, like to thank um, the whole team for putting out quite an extensive FAQ. Um, I know that a lot of folks did have some time to read it and my office will continue to share it um, with the community, but I wanted to thank you for taking the time. It's, it, um, it explains a lot. And so for anybody listening as well, it's an attachment to the agenda and uh, answers a lot of really common questions that my office has been getting as well. So it's a very helpful document. Um, thank you for that. Um, so having said that, I would like to make a motion, which is one to adopt a resolution authorizing the city manager or designee to negotiate and execute the agreement with the board. And then um, two, to establish the trigger for the city's exit plan for the East Lost site, East Lost Lot site will be when the county orders allow for the reopening of the Happy Hollow Park and Zoo. Two, three, to prioritize to the extent possible the population housed in the temporary facilities. 
for interim housing solutions, such as bridge housing communities, but not exclusively, whatever options we can. Um, for to explore utilizing the current on-site security services, which you already did. Um, five, to direct the city manager to develop a strategy for addressing blight that may occur on Story Road. I did notice that you mentioned that on page six of the FAQ, but if you can um, continue to look at that, particularly on the Story Road side, um, I'd like to include that in the motion as well. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Foley? Thank you. Uh, I just needed to put up my crooked house virtual background in honor of Happy Hollow <laughs> and, uh, and do a shout out to a really beautiful, wonderful facility and may we be able to open it up sooner than later. Just two questions, Jackie, is what is the current occupancy at our temporary um, facilities, Southside Hall, Parkside, and Camden Community Center? Or Jim, whoever has. I'm going to let Reagan take that. Reagan, Reagan, okay. Hi. Hi. Uh, just to clarify, do you mean how many people are there right now or what's their total bed capacity? Uh, how many people are there right now? Sure. So Camden currently has uh, six families or 30 people. Parkside has 68 people. South Hall uh is somewhere in the 90s um i'm sorry i don't have the exact number off the top of my head no that's fine uh, the reason i ask is uh didn't santa clara county convention center shut down as a temporary housing facility due to lack of attendance or lack of need yep. are we looking at that are we analyzing Southside, for example for that possibility soon. So the so county that, closed the field medical respite center that was at the convention center and that was for COVID positives. Um, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. Yeah, and we have um, we have more than enough capacity to place COVID positives um, who are homeless in our in a um, hotel motel that we're using. Okay. Our, our greatest need is really for the vulnerable people that we're um, trying to get off the street and allow them to shelter in place. And I just wanted to jump in to say the shelter capacity that even in Camden and at Parkside, uh, none of those are appropriate for these vulnerable populations. And so the the mass shelter is where we're putting homeless people who have asked us for shelter, but who don't meet a priority definition, uh, but still would like to get off the street, obviously because the ability to uh, wash their hands, practice social distancing is still very challenging because they're living on the streets. And so those are different target populations than what we're going to be placing in the trailers. So, uh we don't have folks in the trailers yet. Is that correct? Are you, how, when do you start? When do you, will they be opened? And how will, how will individuals be referred to there? So we don't have uh, individuals in the trailers yet. We plan on opening Thursday and individuals will be referred through the centralized referral program that's being operated by Office of Supportive Housing and Valley Homeless Health Care Program. And uh, the doctors and nurses who are uh, making referrals to the trailers are um, triaging people and assessing them for those pre-existing um, health conditions that make them extremely vulnerable if they were to contract COVID. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. I don't have any other questions. I just want to uh, indicate that I'm going to support wholeheartedly uh, Council Member Esparza's motion. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Jimenez. Thank you. I just have a few questions. Uh, the first one is uh, tied to something Council Member Foley asked about the number of people that are at Parkside Hall and, and uh, Southside Hall. 
are, are we finding that there, and I, I realize those are different than the folks that would be at the bridge housing locations or at the, in the trailers, but are we finding that uh, we're having issues filling the spaces at, at some of these locations? Uh, hi, council member, not yet. Yeah. Uh, last week, there was actually a waiting list uh, for our congregate shelter sites. Okay, cool. So, so the the capacity of 283 at Southside, given the I think the number, well, I forget exactly what number you mentioned for Southside Hall, but uh, I assume we're not at the 283 beds or, or, or number of people there, right? So South Hall, the capacity right now is 100. Um, we'd like to do a second phase, which is a, an additional 100 beds. Uh, in order to do that, we're just uh, hiring some additional staff and adding security to that site. Okay. And is there any sense as to how long we expect, say, for example, Southside, Parkside uh, to, to continue in operation, just given what's happening with the, with the, with the virus and such? So it really all depends. It's, uh, Reagan has coined our phrase that everything is fluid in this work. <laughs> so um, we continue to use that to remind ourselves that conditions change and they can change daily or weekly. And so we continue to monitor what the county health orders are. And when those health orders begin to relax and we begin to move into another phase, then we can evaluate uh, when we would begin to demobilize those. But again, we are working with the county to start crafting a plan now so that we're ready when we need to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the other question I had is uh, related to the trailers. We initially, I guess, received 104 and just in the reading of the information that we were provided, it went down to 90 because some were just uh, unusable or they had issues. Uh, can, can you uh, enlighten us a little bit as to what type of issues these trailers had? I mean, what, what is it that we're, because I'm trying to wrap my head around what possible issues would be, but. I'm just going to start, but I'm going to let Reagan <laughs> take over. Is the, is the list that long? Yes, the list is that long. But I, what I want you to think of is that these trailers, although some of them are quite beautiful and in great condition, there were a significant number of them because they were in storage for a long period of time that had been broken into and uh, items that either had been stolen from them and removed. Uh, and then there were just numerous things that are inoperable, but Reagan has a complete list of everything that needed to be done. Yeah, just, really, you can just run through a few. I, I'm not sure. It, it really, um, there was quite a range, but many of them were missing um, basic things inside, like sinks and countertops. Uh, many of them were missing vents. Some of them did not have the proper electrical, water, or sewer hookups. Okay. All right. I mean, you know, I'm sure the list is much longer. Some of those, the electrical work, for example, certainly we don't want any of these uh, units to catch on fire, obviously. Um, but I, it just comes to mind that uh, I guess some of the things were... were um, you know, they'd be less impactful on someone that was staying there, right? If it's missing like a little desk or whatever, or the table, for example, that wouldn't be as detrimental as inadequate wiring. But okay, that, that helps me get a better understanding. Um, the, the other question I had is, uh, and I think uh, Jim alluded to this a little bit, but uh, it's along the lines of what happens to these trailers after, you know, uh, say we hit, the, you know, the, the things open back up, Happy Hollow Park and Zoo opens back up. Uh, folks are um, sent somewhere else, I'm hoping, but uh, what happens to the trailers? It seemed to me the way you phrased your earlier statement that there are some options. Can you yes, Councilmember, I, I think we're looking at, at three different approaches. Um, potentially the ideal one would be we'd be able to relocate them and stand them up as additional shelter and continue to address our large shelter crisis and need. There's certainly costs associated with that, and there's also finding a location. So we, we need to be able to identify a location to do that. Our second option is we don't want to incur the expense of standing them up to be an active shelter. We could put them in storage if we needed them for some type of future emergency. The third alternative I think that we could consider is if it just isn't uh, the, the value of them to us as a city and what our needs are, 
we could potentially return them as well. I think that's something uh, that we could explore. I don't know how that would work out with Cal OES, but those are the three options we're considering. We'll evaluate all of them and uh, you know, make what we think is the, the most uh, appropriate kind of decision for the city based upon our pandemic needs, our shelter crisis needs, and our kind of fiscal um, kind of efficiency, if you will. So that's, that's how we're assessing the kind of longer term plan with the trailers. Right. And, so, so and, I, and I do want to just add, we're going to learn a lot in the short term about the cost to even operate them right now. Um, mm -hmm. because we're learning, in, uh, it requires a certain amount of a system and a system support in order to, for them to function. I, I've heard a couple of times the issue of why didn't we place them at the fairgrounds. And I do want to know, we had a conversation with the county. The county received 14 of these trailers and they actually tried to set the, these trailers up it, at the fairgrounds, but they were unable to do the hookups there. So they've in fact been asking us, where could we put them? So uh, the fairgrounds just has not been a viable long-term site for these, and we will continue to see uh, what may be. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so, so if they're not hooked up to water and sewer, then they're that that component of the of the unit essentially can't be used, right? Is that that that's correct? Okay. All right. Um, okay. And so, and so Jim, apart from the cost that it would take to, you know, physically move them and, and fund the programming and such, uh, if we decided to keep them, I mean, there, there would be, we wouldn't need to pay the state any, you know, Cal OES, any, any, any money, reimburse them for anything, anything like that? No, my understanding is that is something that they are, they're prepared to pass ownership to the city. I don't okay. think the actual ownership transfer has occurred, but they're certainly prepared to do that. Okay. And then, and so the process by which you're going to use to figure out if we, because my personal opinion is that we, we should, you know, when the orders come down that everything's going to be reopened, that site gets decommissioned. I'd like to see an additional site located across the city somewhere uh, in which we can put these, right? Uh, certainly, the issues with sewer and water, and that's a concern. Uh, but you know that we have folks living in tents <laughs> uh, with tarps, and so um, any you know square box with a roof and walls, I think it serves some purpose. And I'd be curious as, as to what the possibilities are. So, um, so I think I think we completely concur with you on that front. I think it's just finding an appropriate location. And right. Councilor, I think you understand that's something we right. work on regularly um so yeah. we're gonna we will be looking at those options there's and so, no and question so, about that yeah and so i guess what i'm wondering is do you should we is that that decision that you all are going to make um you're in the trenches doing this day in day out but when you make that decision whether to keep relocate give back whatever that may be does that come back to us well i i think it would depend upon kind of the timing of doing that probably the, the sooner that needs to happen uh, and the more we're kind of still in the COVID period, I think that's something that does fall somewhat under the emergency, but the mm -hmm. longer it takes for us to make that decision and more that the use is for shelter and homeless purposes, probably that's something that needs broader discussion would be kind of my initial sense. I don't know if the city manager has anything he wants to add to that, but that's, that's how we're kind of approaching uh, the decommissioning and future use of the trailers. And, and Jim or, or, or anyone, and, and Dave, I don't know if you were going to say something. Let me just say this because I think it might uh, help sort of jog sort of where we may go with this. But I guess what I'm curious about is if, I mean, I have an interest in, in and I think it'd be good to, to find an addition, a different location somewhere across the city that works for this, these units once they're uh, off that site. Um, is it worth including that as part of the direction today that once this is decommissioned to go out and find another location or do you think in your gut do you think it's premature i mean what are your general thoughts well thank you council member um so i do think it's part of the plan that uh, jim described and i would agree with what how jim characterized it and certainly as we you know, go through the decommissioning process and we're looking, I think first and foremost, we will look for the opportunity to relocate the trailers so that they can continue to serve our community. 
and and I do see that as a, as a, a process that we engage the council on that. Um, so um, you know, I, I don't I don't think we need specific direction, but I certainly want to be clear about our intentions, just so that um, uh, we're, we're you know we're we are clear about that. Okay. All right. And then. Uh, um... Dave, just a, a question about uh, some of the direction in Councilmember Esparza's memo. Uh, I, I'm in agreement with all of it. I, I, I'd be curious to see how the phased in sort of approach of Happy Hollow works with the county order and how that shakes out and what, what that process looks like. But uh, I had a question for you, Dave, about number four, direct the city manager to develop a strategy for addressing blight that may occur on Stur Story Road. Uh, obviously, you know, I recognize, as I think all of us do, if, you, if we know the area, the Story Road already has its unique challenges. Um, and so, but I know that when we had conversations about uh, the other interim housing solutions and we, you were pressed a little bit on <laughs> committing to enhanced services and things of that nature, that uh, you seem a little reticent and reluctant to, to provide a hard commitment. And so I'm curious as to how that that sentiment sort of plays out with number four and your feeling about uh, developing a strategy and addressing blight in the area. Yes, so I thank you, Council Member. I mean, I, I do think both, both, both things can be true. It's, it's hard for us to commit to enhanced services, but also important to note that, you know, where we're locating these trailers is a heavily impacted uh, community. Um, and so we want to do everything we can to ensure that um, we don't exacerbate some of the issues going on in that community. So, you know, we're, we're going to do our best. And I, I think item four, um, I think we feel is, is an appropriate, um, you know, direction for us to make sure that we're doing what we can to uh, ensure that, that, you know, they, the conditions in that area are not exacerbated. Okay. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's why I premised my comments with recognizing it's a unique area and, and it certainly has its unique challenges. Uh, the very last question I have is uh, um, number two, I think, and this is just a general question. I suspect staff may be able to answer it because I'm sure some thoughts been given to this. Uh, so um, it's, um, let me find my place. Uh, so the trigger being that the county orders are lifted um, I can also, you know, certainly I appreciate that. I support that. But I know that uh, I, what I imagine that's going to happen is that uh, um, Happy Hollow isn't from one day to the next going to be, you know, flowing with folks, uh, quite possibly. I mean, it's a very popular spot. But um, I'm just trying to think about how this in a practical sense plays out. County lifts the order. Um, the next day we begin the decommissioning process. And that takes, I think I saw 30 to 60 days or whatever that's going to take. Um, we, we feel confident that that transition period is going to happen when there's maybe a lull and in, in interest and in going to Happy Hollow at that time, sort of the ramp up period of sorts. Have we thought about how that will play out? And can you share a little bit about how you envision that happening? Yeah, I'll start and maybe Jackie and Reagan can jump in or Dave, unless Dave, do you want to start? Or well, yeah, I just, yeah, I think I would, Jim. Um, sure. You know, I, I certainly, and I think, I think I just appreciate the way you phrased the question. You know, I do think when um, modifications come to the county health orders, as we've discussed earlier today, I think we'll, we expect to see kind of incremental changes. Certainly, um, when we do see um, the shelter in place order removed, I, I would assume that there will be continued conditions that apply, especially around uh, occupancy limitations um, as part of how we manage through that uh, reopening process. And so, you know, and I think with just to kind of acknowledging the challenges, and I, I said this last week, you know, the reopening process is going to be uh, actually far more challenging than the closure process, because I think we're going to have a lot of overlapping situations that we're going to need to work through. And, and it is what it is. Obviously, we're going to be very, um, want to open up as fast as we can open up and as fast as the, the orders allow us to do so but we'll have to do that in a way that we can manage, you know, all of the conditions that I think will be coming with those, you know, those modifications to the public health orders. So I, I do think we're contemplating this overlap scenario where we're gonna need to be kind of, you know, working through decommissioning in this site and then how are we opening up Happy Hollows to let our residents come 
come back into you know a wonderful facility. So um, I think your question is totally legit, and and we've got a lot of work to do to kind of make that all happen. Um, so, anyways, Jim, do you want to add anything? Well, Dave, I think you've, I think you've framed it well. I think I would add in that we also have to have confidence in working with the county that we've kind of met the need for sheltering at-risk populations, that they're not out and putting themselves at risk and the general population at risk. So we want to kind of have the dual um, criteria or factors of we've, we've substantially gotten through the COVID crisis and the need for them is not there at, like it is kind of today and the opening of the park and, and the phasing into that opening. I think they're going to work together uh, is, is what we had kind of suggested, what Jackie had laid out in her presentation. Totally appreciate everybody's interest in getting Happy Hollow open and, and functioning again. That's our absolute interest as well. We're very closely talking with uh, the Parks Department and John Cicerelli. So we'll, we will develop that plan kind of collectively uh, to really try and really thread that needle that you kind of described, Dave, that balancing act. Okay, thank you. And I promise this is my last question. It's related to the recommendation in the staff memo. It talks about it's retroactive, the agreement May 1st to October 31st. Is that to suggest October 31st is the day that this would be decommissioned as it currently sits? Would the contract need to be amended if the order goes to November or December? Or, or I'm trying to make sense of, maybe I'm not reading it correctly. Hi, council member. Uh, that's our starting point in contract negotiations, but there's a, there's a clause that lets us get out early if things are opening up um, and we need to de decommission the site. And there's a clause that also lets us extend if for some reason we're sheltering in place past October. But I would have way too many gray hairs to shelter in place <laughs> beyond October. Yeah. All right. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you so much. Council member Jeff. Yes, sir. So I just had a, a question about uh, council member Esparza's memo. I, I support the notion, but I just had a question about the logistics of it. Um, because I, I think Jackie has stated in, in previous council meetings that there's a, some sort of countywide processing system. So like, that's why we might be housing somebody up in North County in our tiny home village site by the Barrios and Bart station because there's a common intake. So I'm, I'm just curious if, if we say that, you know, whoever is in this tent or these tents are going to get uh, priority processing, does that interfere with that countywide system? No, so as we have been creating the BHC, the first of all, the emergency sites, we have contemplated that there's going to be this transition period between them being fully emergency to perhaps being able to house some transitional people, meaning people who were in other sites that we still need to house um, before it then fully converts to its final form. So we're actually planning for a full spectrum of needs depending upon where we're at and what we need. Okay, that was my only question. All right, thank you for clarifying. You're our uh, two members of the community, uh, I think, had difficulty calling in, I'm told. And so we're going to go back to uh, those callers uh, and we'll try to take it offline to see if there may be a problem with phone in uh, public comment. Um, so the caller with the last four digits, 0197, if you could take your phone off mute. Welcome. Yes, uh, Mayor Lucargo, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Mayor, Mayor Licardo. Thank you very much. I know it's been a long afternoon for you and the rest of the council members, but I just wanted to make a quick point. I think the first three uh, public speakers pretty much summed it up. I think uh, the first speaker was was very good in, in their summation and also the two uh, Happy Hollow commissioners. I think uh, no, one's, no one is debating whether or not that there is a need for, for, these, for the homeless people and for people especially who are infected with COVID-19 to be housed properly and safely. The question is, is the location and, and, and the common sense that went into the decision to put it at that site. Um, I'm, I'm disturbed and disappointed as a taxpayer that uh, 
I, I was born and raised in San Jose, and, and uh, I paid taxes to have phenomenal parks like Happy Halloween. Of course, they have a really class zoo there. And I don't know, did any of the council even think of the stigma that, that could be associated with this after putting these, these trailers there with people who are infected with this disease? Uh, it just really bothers me. And, and uh, I don't know, it, maybe people have a short memory, but does the jungle uh, ring anybody's bell in terms of in their head as to what where that was? That was right across the street. So I don't think there was any creativity in putting these, the location of these trailers there. It just boggles my mind. And, and I just wanted to, to appeal to your collective maybe common sense and maybe do things that maybe just because you can do it, don't do it that way, but do it with the interest of the public health and safety in mind. And, and again, I appreciate the time that you gave me to talk. And, and again, but unfortunately, poor governance starts at the local level. And unfortunately, it looks like it has been displayed here today. Thank you and have a good and be safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, the person with the phone number ending 6910, welcome. Hi, um, I just wanted to point out that the 6420 number that the county is using to screen people for VHHP to get people into trailers, hotels, et cetera, has not been successful. It's been very, very hard for unhoused people and advocates to get people through that system. And I think congratulating anybody on the misuse or the failure to get people into hotels, shelters, and obviously now the trailers. This has not been a good system for unhoused people to use. We're not getting people into places quickly enough, and obviously these trailers. And as quickly as we're trying to get people into these trailers, now we're saying, oh, and now let's get them out as fast as we can. We need to be getting more people into places like this, not getting them out as quickly, and we need to explore more options, be it sanctioned encampments, um, or anything else, and it just makes me sad that as soon as we're finally going to open these trailers, finally, 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 now we're just like, let's get them out of here as quickly as possible, um, and it just makes me sad, and please understand that anytime we hear talking about blight, we hear sweeps, so for anybody who says anything about blight, we know that that means that you're going to be ramping up sweeps, and that concerns us greatly because we certainly haven't done enough to get people housed before we start sweeping them again. Thanks. I um, wanted to thank you for your comment. I want to address the concerns that was raised by the, the most recent member of the public. Um, first, I, I am not optimistic that there's going to be a county order that allows any significant of public con amount of public convening, uh, such as what we'd have at Happy Hollow anytime in the near future. I think that is uh, likely going to be one of the last things the county is likely to allow based on what we know about the public health impacts of bringing a lot of people together. Um, so uh, I, I don't think it's imminent that we're going to be suddenly breaking this up, uh, but I do think there's a really a very serious concern raised about the pace at which we can get people housed and the challenge of getting through um, the county process. And, and, and I know this is not the first time you've heard that concern, uh, Jackie or Reagan, and I'm just wondering, are we are we sensing there's any progress here? Are we, is, there, is there some learning that's going on in the system that's enabling us to hopefully improve? I'm gonna let Reagan take this because she actually sits at the EOS. <laughs> in the I'm sorry, Reagan. And it's like right next door to where people are answering phones and so she can yeah. give some insight into the system. Uh, yeah, I do sit next to our uh, doctors and nurses and outreach workers who are answering the phones um, day in and day out here. So, you know, we have a, as I said earlier, we have a waiting list for our congregate shelter sites. And I feel like we have been able to um, process and take those referrals quite quickly. Um, you know, the vulnerable folks have been um, kind of almost stop and start when we have, we know we have units coming online, hotel, motels, then there's a push 
um, to be taking our referrals. Um, and even for the trailer site, knowing that it's coming online soon, um, we're actively working ahead of time to get that waiting list um, up and ready so that when we do open, we have folks who are ready to go that day. Um, I'd say that's probably the biggest um, learning or shift that I've noticed happening here is um, as the county secures another hotel or motel and we know it's coming online in three days or five days is starting those um, getting people from the queue and getting them ready. And the one thing that I would add just for clarification is that uh, the they get a lot of calls for people who want to be sheltered but who end up not meeting the priority. And then when an offer is to go into one of the congregate shelters, then that's not readily accepted for all people. They really would like to be in a motel or in a private space. And we have been very clear that we will continue to hold those spaces for vulnerable populations or for COVID po positive people, uh, for those that are at most risk. And we are not using uh, these places where we can isolate people, whether it be the trailers or the motel hotel spaces for people who don't have that level of vulnerability. And I think that's where we're getting a lot of people that are disappointed and unhappy because they don't necessarily want to go into a shelter. And we just don't have the capacity to meet, um, as we all know, there's 6,000 homeless people in the city of San Jose. We don't have 6,000 spaces. So we have to prioritize. Okay, thank you. Appreciate the, the explanation. So we just got to keep building. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? If not, we have a motion, I believe, from Councilmember Sparza. Yes. Okay, Tony? Jimenez? Yes. Perales? Diep? Aye. Carrasco? Davis? Aye. Es Esparza? Yes. Arenas? Yes. Foley? Aye. Camus? Yes. Jones? Aye. Licardo? Aye. Okay, I have Carrasco and Perales absent. Uh, this is Perales. I don't know. I'm sorry, I might have not hit the unmute. Uh, I'm an I vote. Okay, thank you. Carrasco? Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, thanks everybody. Uh, I think that is it until, uh, let's see, open forum. Uh, Mr. Beekman? Hello, can you hear me? Yep. Thank you. Uh, in my open forum speech, uh, to address overall uh, uses of natural gas and mass transit uses, uh, I've tried to stay here in many public comments here over the past few years. There's been a good procedural review process planned for the 2020s and how to leave the dependency and use of heavier, dirtier oil of fracked fossil fuel. I did not expect COVID-19 would be how to talk about a reduction of fossil fuel use and fracked gas in the 2020s. The ETA gave very, very good lectures in the spring of 2018 to warn of an upcoming e economic disruption process. I was comforted this work and efforts from all of us uh, at this time was actually neutralizing and protecting ourselves from another decade in the use of state-sponsored violence and extremism based on the white collar ideas of shock doctrine, disaster capitalism practices. But that was yesterday. We now have to relearn how to prioritize human needs of health, food, and shelter. We are all making adjustments to our lives at this time. But overall, I hope in the future, the concepts of impasse can be solved with simple dedication and commitment to continual honest negotiation and dialogue with the intention to always find meaningful agreements. These are the ideas of how to create positive sustainability for our future, our common future. Uh, once again, our human race has created a mess, possibly from the ideas of a few elites. It is up to our human decency to find good ways to clean up this mess at this time. 
I don't think it is looking up, it is locking up blameless people, tenants and owners alike in the practices of long-term debt. It is time to once again ask our human race how we can mature to not harm each other in our long-term ideas of social planning for the future. I hope we are all considering a future of what can be simpler practices in working together and what can be more positive sustainability concepts in what can be a collective good long-term future. Thank you. And just to quickly add, I hope uh, everyone is looking into the idea of cutting down the trees on Post Street Alleyway in downtown San Jose. I'm, I'm worried about this issue. Can it be looked into and can the trees be saved? That's uh, my question. And can I get a, a letter back from someone why exactly they're being cut down? Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, I want to uh, go back on the last item, Tony. Uh, I got a text from Councilman Magdalena Carrasco indicating that, uh, that she's having problems with her device. The Zoom's not allowing her to unmute. Did you get a yes vote for her? I did. Okay, great. All right, wonderful. In that case, uh, the meeting's adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Stay healthy.